Joe Rogan Podcast, check it out. The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan Podcast by night, all day. Are we rolling? <clears throat> What's going to catch up? I said we're just going to catch up. It's oh. been a year. It's been a year. Yeah. And you've been trending on Twitter for uh, that entire year. <laughs> <laughs> It's not my fault. Those fucking <laughs> dorks. Get out of the house, losers. <laughs> go pay attention to real life shit. Every time While I Fauci's go Fauci's out there torturing puppies. <laughs> you see that shit? I, yeah. I did saw, you, watch, did I you did, read that article? I didn't read the article. I shut up. I can't look at puppy torture. What are they learning from torturing? But pull up the article, Jamie, because people <laughs> need to know this. Because I put it up on Twitter, but this is sick shit. Glenn, Glenn Greenwald uh, texted me about this, and he was kind of explaining that it doesn't help anything. There, there's no benefit. There's no benefit to this, right? He's like this is not something that's saving lives so like if, if you could prove that this was saving lives he goes maybe you can make some sort of Ethical argument for doing this, but it doesn't save lives. It's just not yeah, and it's twisted and I don't understand it I just saw bipartisan side. legislators demand answers from Fauci on cruel puppy experiments our investigators show that Fauci's NIH division shipped part of its part of a $375,800 grant to a lab in Tunisia to drug beagles and lock their heads in mesh cages filled with hungry sand flies so that the what? insects could eat them alive. I feel like in a normal society, this guy would just be completely retreated from the public by How now. How is this possible? How is it possible, first of all, that now it's been proven, the NIH has now come out and said, yeah. he lied. Yeah. He lied in front of Congress about gain-of-function research. They funded gain-of-function research at the Wuhan lab that worked on coronaviruses in the very fucking area where a <laughs> coronavirus got out and killed four million people. With cleavage sites that were inserted into it that seemed to indicate that it's been manipulated. Like, all these indications. Yeah, that the were, by the way, all conspiracies. These were all just conspiracies. If you even suggested any of this, that oh, it yeah. came from a lab, that it was funded, oh, yeah. all of it is now true, and no one says sorry. It's how I got trended on Twitter. <laughs> it's one of the one of the one ways of the I reason. got trended on Twitter from when Brett Weinstein was on, oh, and right, Brett right. was saying this that it, it seems to indicate this was in April of 2020. Brett was saying it seems to indicate that this is a, a virus that's been manipulated. And everyone's like, that is a dangerous conspiracy theory, <laughs> and it's racist. <laughs> racist conspiracy theory. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's actually accurate. And it's, it's our own government was involved, yeah. which is the most fucked up thing, because as things have been uncovered, as Josh Rogan uncovered it, Josh Rogan played a, a very big part in this, because Josh Rogan recognized that he was one of the first people, and he, he actually broke it on this podcast, that Fauci was the one who restarted the gain-of-function research that Obama, right. had, rightly and smartly, had said, hey, stop doing that shit. <laughs> the fuck are you doing? And so then Trump came along with Fauci, like, this is important research. We need to do, we need to try to kill the world. Uh, yeah. Fuck. It's this is so crazy that this is not, like, if you go to all these mainstream news places, they're not saying this. Yeah, they how can. Are you, how are you not saying this? I, I, they don't understand why they've lost all their credibility, and yet it, they behave as if the internet doesn't exist. <laughs> right. Well, how is CNN not covering this? Go, go to the, Fa the Fauci story, because it is so crazy. Because when you watch Rand Paul grill him. Yeah. And he's like, with all due respect, Senator, <laughs> you do not know what you are talking about. You do a good impression of him. I could do a better one if I listen to him. If I listen to him for like 10 minutes, I can really get him. I, I remember that Rand Paul recently was like, someone owes me an apology. Just, what are you doing? I don't know. What you said oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There was another one um, uh, in my, um, it, it's in my Twitter, that uh, in a shocking turn of events, the NIH has now admitted which is interesting because if they're admitting that they funded game to function research, that means they're turning on that little monster. So if they're turning right. on him, that, that means like we might actually see some progress here and some a, a real objective understanding of what's happening. In major shift, NIH admits funding risky virus research in Wuhan. Now this is Vanity Fair, okay, super liberal publication. Mm -hmm. So if they're doing this, that means the tide has turned. A spokesperson for Dr. Fauci says he has been entirely truthful. But a new letter belatedly acknowledging that the National Institute of Health support 
for virus enhancing research adds more heat to the ongoing debate over whether a lab leak could have sparked the pandemic. I'm going to go out on a limb and say yes, it did. <laughs> it seems like this that fucking, would be the obvious. This natural conclusion. spillover shit, like the, you don't have an example. You, there's like yeah. there's no science that points to that. All the science points to a manipulated virus that came out of the very area where they manipulate viruses. Like when when John Stewart went on that rant on right. Colbert show, and he got canceled I, for a minute. Canceled. It didn't even work. <laughs> but I was like, yes, John Stewart. John Stewart is a fucking man. Yeah, he's honest. He's brave. He he he's not. You know, he's not that guy that's going to bullshit just for the party. Yeah, and just toe the line. He's not going to do it. Thank God. Thank God there's guys like him out I there. I mean, yeah, I think his, I think he's always been pretty good about that. but About everything. Yeah. yeah. And his new show, I think, is, I haven't watched it, but I hear that it's pretty serious. If he's involved, it's good. Yeah. If he's involved, I'm in. I just love what he did for all the guys down at Ground Zero. Yes, yes, Like, yes. that's when I, re I always liked him, but I really just respected him a hundred times more when he fought so hard for them. He's a national hero. John John Stewart really is. And you know, when he's not on the air and then you see him again, you appreciate him. Like, God damn it, I wish he was back. Because when he was hosting the Daily Show, the Daily Show was fucking it was perfect. I don't even watch it now. I watch no. it now. Like this is nonsense. Like this is A lot of people kind of blame him for the the state of news today though. You know, he he did pioneer the form of making jokes out of the news. Who else is doing that now, though? Everybody, even the news. <laughs> but they're doing it accidentally. <laughs> they're doing they it with the jokes on them. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's crazy times. I feel. I thought. I don't know what I thought when we last sat down. It was a year ago. You just moved here, and had things started opening up. What well, I don't even remember. Here they were open. Yeah, they were yeah. pretty much open. Yeah. But not where but everybody, I was. Everybody thought it was really it's reckless. It's still closed in LA. <laughs> yeah, LA is still closed. Well, it's, if it's not closed, everyone's terrified. It's, it's a it is a it's a suicide pact. I'm convinced. When I was back there a few weeks ago, I was like, oh my god, the, like the the general feeling in the air, the tone. Everyone's scared. Yeah. And crime is off the fucking charts. I mean, yeah. My neighborhood, just this last weekend, we were opening our door to go film Dumpster Fire, and there's always police helicopters around, so we're used to it. We often have to, like, pause because we live, we're in such a high-class, like, filming environment. <laughs> 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 and then, so there's always, like, some shit going down, and we had to, we were, oh, we're used to having to pause for, like, the helicopters, and we walk out, and this, over the PA, it's like, get inside your house, <laughs> close your doors, and lock them. We were like, oh, shit. <laughs> and then we hear, put your hands, put your hands up where you, we can see them, and come out of the building. So apparently some guy, it started on... A, a local business and then guys chase this one guy out and he was trying to attack people with I don't even know what and then he was jumping from um, like yard to yard like Ferris Bueller <laughs> only trying to break in and and attack people oh and so God. it was like this whole insane I was like what are we doing here this is nuts and that's just my my friend who's on the show, she was like, oh, somebody exposed himself. I'm like, I don't, it's not like a walk with my dog if somebody doesn't expose themselves. That's just normal. They don't, they don't arrest people in LA anymore. No. So apparently with this guy, we got even more details. He had done the same thing a couple weeks ago and attacked somebody, I think with a knife and Gascon let him out in six hours. Yeah, that's what they're doing. You yeah. know about the guy who got macheted on the beach with his family? No. A homeless guy who's a fucking psychopath who pulled a, a knife on a sheriff. They arrested him, Gascon let him back on the street, and then he macheted some poor guy with his family on the beach. The guy lost his eye. Oh, God. Cut his face, his hand, his tongue. This guy was swinging a fucking machete at a father in front of his children on the beach. Yeah, it's scary. I mean, the Gascon is a scary guy. Yeah, it's, like it, he it's, he like embodies all of the fears of like the George Soros conspiracy theory that George <laughs> Soros is trying to destroy the country right, right. and do so with like b putting in more and more liberal people, like the more uh, progressive, like anti uh, anti law enforcement, completely, completely anti. And then when they gets when he gets them in the office, then he funds someone who's even more to the left and runs them against them. Yeah. No, it's 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 the quality of life is 
drastically gone down. I don't see it improving. You know, it's it's not like there's any, there doesn't seem to be anything stopping. And even, I you saw when you left, and it's it's even worse. I mean, we go drive, and they're just full tent communities under pretty much every freeway. And it's hard because I'm a compassionate person who has empathy, and you you seeing this every day, you have to start to, like, turn your heart off a little. And I'm also just disgusted at how gross the city looks. It looks yeah. like shit. It looks like shit. I have a, a, a good friend who's very progressive, very liberal, and he lives in Brentwood. He's also wealthy. Oh, Brentwood's nuts. Brentwood is so far fucked right now with oh, tents. Oh, nuts. And he's like, I the... can't be-. He's turning. He's like red-pilling. He's like, I can't believe this. In this <laughs> incredible, expensive neighborhood with this insane real estate like this, these like some of the most expensive real estate in LA, and we've got fucking tents everywhere. And he's someone like, died at that encampment. There was a like some homeless person ran into another homeless person at that at that like right along the veteran place in Brentwood. You mean headbutted him? No, it, with a car, took oh. a car and like ran into someone and killed them. Re- if what you're happened homeless, a couple- but you have a car, are you still homeless? <laughs> There, like if you, if you have a van, <laughs> if you have a van, are you still homeless? I think they are included in that population. What if you have like a camper van? Are you still homeless? I mean, I feel like they're still maybe. I don't know. What if you have one of them mobile I would, ones? I want to know everywhere. Because, well, because they used to have those strict laws about how you couldn't park, yeah. and then there were all, now there are like fires all the time because people in Venice are like cooking meth in there. <laughs> Yes. It's crazy. My friend had to leave Venice. She yeah. was like, I couldn't. I. She was like, I didn't realize how just desensitized to the smell of urine and meth I had become. <laughs> that is so bad. I, I went to Venice the other day. Went to Felix, the restaurant in Venice, uh-huh. my favorite restaurant on earth. And uh, as we were driving there, we passed like literally a hundred of those camper trucks in a row. Yeah. They just they just they. That's where they live now. They just pull on the side of the road and stop their their camper truck. Yep. I went with Schellenberger, who you recently had yeah. on. We went down to see the big encampment down in Venice and go watch while they were actually, they just happened to be cleaning up some of the beaches. And then we went down to Skid Row that day. And it was, it was, I Skid Row is eye opening because it's always been there, but it's huge now. It's yeah. many, 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 many blocks. And even they were saying that they're now. 47 families. There aren't supposed to be kids on Skid Row. And the guy was saying they that is, as the last count, there were 47 families down there. And that was like real, You could, that felt like a real, that was interesting because it was all black people down in Skid Row, pretty much 99%. And then out on the west side, like crazy white people. And... It so felt, we have segregated homeless It's encampments? weird. It's weird because it felt really like systemic poverty in Skid Row. You know, it felt very much like um, the system had failed these people and, and drastically and no one really freaking cared. And in L.A., like out on the west side, it felt like a lot of mental illness, clearly, but... A lot of it's just kind of, oh, God, this is going to sound horrible, but it felt like LARPing, you know, like, I'm going to go be like a homeless person on the beach and do drugs. There just is a vibe of... Really? Yeah, it's weird because there you can come to L.A. and they'll give you money and you can just do drugs and never get arrested. You can go to... California just has... Very, same in San Francisco. It's not like you're going to get arrested if you do. They'll put you back on the street. There was like a vibe of... Um, I don't know. It felt, it was like a, a lifestyle, you know, it felt more like a, a lifestyle choice. Like people, because they say, why are all these people homeless? Well, a lot of people, they don't take the offer to get off of the street. They don't want shelter. They don't, they don't want to give up their drugs. That's the big one. Yeah. Is that if you go into a lot of these shelters, they require you to be clean. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people trying to get clean in those shelters, so it would be very hard if you're surrounded by people who are doing drugs. Yeah, it's one of the dumbest things about Austin is that I think they're moving it now, but there's a homeless shelter that's right next to Sixth Street. 
Oh, okay. Where everybody's drunk. Yeah. So you're literally one block away from the biggest party street in all of Austin. And you're like, hey, time to clean up, everybody. Let's clean up right here where you can hear the fucking music blaring. That's like that rehab that's right on Venice Boulevard, the one that Phoenix or whatever. It's like right on the strip. I'm really? like, who the fuck is getting sober in this place? <laughs> <laughs> you walk out the door and it's like, yeah, well, get whatever you want. Well, that's a good place if, you're really, if your intentions are really just to make money and your intentions are not to, to make people clean, you will have a never-ending supply of people that need rehab if you just go right to them. And they don't have to travel. Yeah. They can just literally shuffle over barefoot and stumble into your rehab. That's such an unregulated industry, too. The, you know, the like halfway houses or the... What are they called now? Like the sober livings? Yeah. You, I could start a sober living if I wanted. There's no regulation on this. And they're super expensive and people get sent to them. Obviously, parents are worried about their kids. They get sent out to L.A. for these fancy rehabs. And then they all end up homeless and, <laughs> in Venice. <laughs> you know, no, they a lot of there's just so much churn. And it, they all there's so many people that go out to get sober and clearly don't. Well, the ones that are in Malibu are the real fancy schmancy ones, right? Yeah. They're the ones where you do yoga and yeah, you, drink you get like massages. <laughs> and it, how often do they work? When, That's what I want to know. When I got sober, it was I was 19 the first time I got sober. My I remember calling the woman and she, she I had been in a rehab for a week and then my insurance ran out. So I put myself on general assistance. This was in Minnesota. And um went and called this place and this woman answered and she, I was like, hey, and I needed to go to an all-female one because like some dude tried to do something with me in the last one. So I wanted all women. Women! And <laughs> <laughs> People can't see it. Is, is that that's something you yell in your women! podcast all the time? I always yell it on Dumpster Fire. Just what it, what's because, the context? Because they're always saying like birthing people yeah, or right? people with vaginas yeah. and I'm like, women! <laughs> and, Isn't like, that crazy? Can we just say the word? Lactating people. So it was all women, and I called, and this woman, um, she's like, you ever heard of boot camp? And that's what, that's what it was like. It was 40 women, and I had to do dish. We had dish duty. We had It was very regimented, and they kicked our asses. It was run pretty much all by lesbians. They just kicked our butts. They, saw, they had seen it was mostly women who were avoiding prison, and I was like the youngest one there. And they had seen every lying, shady maneuver, and they just saw through all of our shit. And I, those women saved my life. Wow. I never did heroin again. I mean, I, I continue to do a lot of other things, but <laughs> never did heroin again. So it, it's, it's incremental <laughs> steps of, of sobriety. <laughs> yeah, it's harm reduction. <laughs> get, get out of the heroin. But what did you do after you did, stopped doing heroin? Oh, man. I mean, I just celebrated eight years of sobriety last Monday, actually. Thank you. It's a big deal for me. It's a huge deal. Yeah. Listen, that's awesome. Yeah. It was, um, uh. What year did I meet you? We met, I remember you were working out your Kim Kardashian stuff. Okay. So that was 2015 probably. Yeah. Oh. Around maybe earlier. Minute, Kim Kardashian stuff was, uh. I felt like it was earlier. The one about if the aliens came down, we would have to explain Kim Kardashian. That would be the most no, difficult No, it was the one where you got on the stool. Oh, that's, no, that's the Bruce Jenner one. Yeah, the Bruce yeah, Jenner yeah. one. That was 2000. I started writing in, I think, 14, 15. Yeah, that was, that's about right. Whenever the Vanity Fair cover came out. Yeah. That's when I was like, oh, okay. Because I had seen you do stuff before, but then I saw that bit and I was like, whoa, your shit's take, gone to another level at some time in the past couple of years. And then. You told me to start a podcast. <laughs> yes, I did. I remember that. <laughs> and I'm, it was early in the podcast. You know, they yeah. hadn't like not everyone had a podcast, and I'm glad I I listened to you. Well, you're born for it. You really are a born podcast. You always have a well thought out but controversial opinion. <laughs> you know, like that's it's podcast. not controversial though. It's not to me. But it is it's to not to most the lemmings. average like Americans or average not even Americans. I don't think I really don't think what you and I talk about is controversial. It's controversial <laughs> to people that only watch CNN and controversial to people that don't read and controversial to people that don't question narratives. They don't go, hey, why are they trying to vaccinate all the fucking kids? Right. When we know that it's not bad for kids. Like what is going on here? Like, yeah, do you, like what is the one. what are the long term safety studies on this? Like, what's the negative side of it? What's the like when you say things like that? There's so many people that are like, oh, what is he saying? This is a conspiracy theory. In the no, 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 no. It's not. What, what you 
all these years, we've been skeptical of pharmaceutical companies. That's what's all crazy these years. to me. All these Especially years. on the left, yes. which is where oh, we yeah. come from. Yes, all these years. Yes. I mean, I had to dial it back on my big pharma skepticism because I was such a hippie for so many years. And... I ended up being really down that rabbit hole of like big pharma yeah. and I worked on weed farms and there's a lot of talk about that kind of thing up up in those environments. And then people were saying, you know, they would point out like, well, they also develop a lot of other things that help people. <laughs> yeah. And because we have we there is competition and it is there there is life saving vaccines and yeah. medicine. When I say, yeah. When I say vaccinate kids, I mean for COVID nineteen. No, I know, I clearly, know. but I want to be clear on that yeah. so that people don't take this out of context. <laughs> I'm be not like, talking. Joe Rogan's an anti. Yeah, my children are fully vaccinated yeah. for everything other than COVID, and they both had COVID. So. Yeah, I wrote a piece of uh, making fun of all of the like anti vaxxers because there was a measles outbreak in LA. Yes. So I wrote a satirical piece about anti vaxxers, and people call me an anti vaxxer for being against the mandates and the vax ports and things like that. I'm like. Not an anti-vaxxer. They're, they basically co- compare you to, like, Jenny McCarthy now. The crazy thing... <laughs> I know, it's really funny. But the crazy thing about the vaccine thing is that the mandate in the beginning was dismissed by the White House, was dismissed by Jen Psaki, the press secretary, dismissed by everyone. Yeah. That is not going to happen. That's not possible. It's, we're not going to do this. And then they start implementing it. Yeah. It just t- it's a slow, slippery slope. And that's why you got to be very careful of every little piece of ground you give up and when people think I'm hyperbolic when I'm talking about that this is a slow slide into dictatorship it really is what the fuck is happening right now in Australia that is essentially a police state how did that happen so quickly because this is how it goes this is how it goes when you have this slow slide into authoritarianism I am reluctant to give new power to politicians. I think it's fucking dangerous yeah. because they're, they're weasels and they're lazy and they don't think things through and they don't think about the greater good of mankind. They think about what's easier for them. What's the easiest way for them to impose their mandates? And make keep their, their job. Right, right, right. Make the, the special interest groups that they you know are really beholden to, make those people happy. What's mm-hmm. the best way? Yeah, there's there's a lot there. The Australia thing's interesting because I remember being in Australia when I was on that cult, which we've talked about in past episodes. There there were when you were in the cult. Is that <laughs> when I got like stuck on the sex cult, we talked about it. I think yes. I, I don't want to bore you. What listeners. episode? Which one was that? The I don't last remember. One? It might have been or two ago. Um, w- yeah, so I was there, but we were driving around, and I remember there were like all these police cameras that just took pictures if you were speeding and it yeah. was there was already a little bit of a like police state vibe in parts of Australia that I was like, "Huh, I didn't expect this coming from Australia." And when I was going off about Australia, somebody pushed back and they said, "You know, the the overwhelming population will get in queues and line up and they're actually very a, a people who will actually listen to rules and follow these orders and they have had low counts and whatever but i still think um it's terrifying (laughs) it's fucking terrifying it's not it's not just terrifying they don't have any recourse well someone said don't forget because i was like aren't you guys all criminals and it's like yeah but it's also a population of of people who were you know police essentially Yeah. yeah And so there, there's that population down prison, there. Prison colony and police. Yeah, it's all just, interbreeding. Yeah, <laughs> just, I don't know. It's a, it's a. Everything feels a little bit out of control. And this, so to go back to when you, when we met, I think I was sober already. I think I was like newly sober. Just yeah. to circle back to that, and to anyone wondering when I actually did get sober, 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 it was when I was. 35 so like eight years ago and but it was like a long time coming i from the i when i was first in rehab i was 19 and then from 20 to 35 it was like coke and molly and weed and yeah (laughs) drinking it was i i i I lived my life to the fullest (laughs) but i probably should have died i mean it's a miracle i didn't die did you ever od 
So right before I got sober, I was doing La Tamale at um, Coachella, which sounds as disgusting as you just heard it. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, it gets grosser. <laughs> and um, the I was probably dehydrated because I don't think I had any water in like two days. <laughs> and I was like doing Molly during the day and doing Blow at night and drinking through the whole thing. And I was really obsessed with this like blueberry Red Bull that they had. I fucking hate Red Bull, but I was just drinking it with and it was like laced with Molly or whatever. So that was like and then we were in VIP. This is why I'm saying it's going to get grosser, guys. So bear with me. And we're walking and I went down like. I just blacked out. I was like, I looked at my friend and I was like, I am fucking roll. And that's the last <laughs> thing I remember. <laughs> and I just went down like a, like just a, a bowling pin and apparently into some Australian chicks of all things. And I wake up, come to, and there's like four cops standing around me and they're like, what day is it? And I somehow knew it was Sunday. And I mean, you've been to festivals. You have no idea what day it is, even if you're sober, like, right. or what time it is. Right. And I knew what time. It was like my brain got a hard reset. I really, <laughs> I really think my brain was like, we're shutting it down. <laughs> like, yeah. we need to reset Let's delete the some system. Files. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Reboot. <laughs> Reboot. I came to, I was like freezing cold. And, and the Australians were like, you have the worst friends. You have the worst friends. The worst friends? Because they weren't too, they were like, eh, she'll be fine. Oh, and they're one, tripping. One of my friends is one of my best friends from high school. And she and I, she was around during the heroin days. And we used to go to raves together and do like speed. And so we had been through a lot. And she was like, eh, she's taking a disco nap. And they were like, they called it a disco nap? <laughs> a <laughs> your, disco your nap? Your friend called it a disco nap? Oh, my nap. God. You have a horrible friends? I was that, like, That oh. is a very funny statement. <laughs> a disco nap. Yeah, she's taking a disco nap. That's a f good phrase. Oh, yeah. I like that phrase. So I came, I came to, luckily. But it was like a bit of a wake-up call. And I wasn't young. I was like about to be... 35 or maybe already was 35 like yeah. it was a little bit old to be blacking out come, going down and vip <laughs> like oh just so gross it was so gross i mean pitiful demoralization but the fact that your friends said you you're taking a disco nap like yeah. they they're like ah she's fine let's keep partying then i found a yankees hat and i put it on and that's when i knew it's time to get sober <laughs> <laughs> so where did you go to get did you go to get sober on did you do it on your no, own yeah i just so i had tried everything like every i mean i was i was the classic like only drink only drink booze only drink alone only drink with friends only sm i did the whole like marijuana maintenance only smoke weed i got certified in yoga become a yoga instructor <laughs> I, I went to therapy literally anything other than 12 step because I had been in 12 step when I was 19, 20 that first time and I hated it because <laughs> I couldn't drink <laughs> mm. at all and I couldn't do anything. And I just, I came up with a big, you know, I, I, I came up with a big case against 12 step. I was like, it's fear based and blah, 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 and all the God stuff. And I was off and running. And I was out, my first husband and I were raging alcoholics, we were in the restaurant industry. I was in the restaurant industry for a long time in my life. That industry is riddled with alcoholism and drugs and partying. And so I was just around it too all the time. And then um, around 35, after that Coachella, that summer, I had just gotten back from traveling around the world for like two years. I was very lost. I was in LA and I didn't know what I was doing anymore. I felt confused. I went back east, worked in a restaurant where I had been, and it was like this whole, I fell immediately into the rut. I was like sleeping with the same douchebags I slept with when I had been there like seven years before, having, doing tons of drugs, burning bridges with my family, and I was coming back to LA after just, my sister wouldn't let me stay with her, and rightfully. And I was a mess and I was coming back and I was like, I'm going to cop heroin and kill myself, basically. I was just so Whoa. internally, it was not necessarily like many of my rock bottoms were actually physical or my first one, I lost everything. This was more emotional. And um, yeah, I was, I, I went for a hike. I went up to like Temescal because I was like, well, before I cop heroin, I should 
maybe pause and go for a hike. And sometime on that hike, I decided to go to a meeting that night because I'd done an experimental year of sobriety in like 2010. What was it about the hike that? I was sweating and my, I was like sweating out. I was just toxic. I could feel how toxic I was. I could smell how toxic I was. What did it smell like? Oh, uh, like chemicals? chemicals and blow and probably like, baby powder, I mean, you know, like everything, just booze. And, and and I had been smoking a lot of weed to try and chemically balance all of it. And I ended up getting to the top and something, it was like, they call it like, it was like a window of grace. I don't know. It was like one small window of willingness. I don't, I don't window know. Window of grace? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It was like, they're, they say there are these kind of like opportunities where you can walk through a like door of willingness if you're you're really at rock bottom and trying to get and I made I've joked about this before I made alcoholism look amazing like I I had a lot of fun (laughs) (laughs) I was I was kill I was like from the outside it looked okay it was just internally I felt like I was rotting to the core Mm. and I also couldn't really get out of my own way And so I went to a meeting and I didn't even, I wasn't like, I'm getting sober. I just didn't know what else to do. And I was miserable. I mean, I was fucking miserable the first two years of my sobriety. But it was better than feeling like I wanted to kill myself. Mm. And so I just kept walking through it and doing what they told me to do. They're like, get a stupid job. So I was waiting tables and like. Why why did they say to get a stupid job? They're just, you're, you know, a lot of times you have this kind of idea of being a big shot or not that I did at all. I was still waiting tables and like broke all the time. But it's really just this idea of like being a worker among workers, like put yourself in a get a day job so you can pay your bills and not be dependent and struggling and put yourself in because uh, sometimes it's like people who come from, you know, finance or whatever. They, they were big shots and then they kind of lose everything. And so then they tell them to get a job Everybody to humble needs, themselves. Well, yeah. The and just for just for consistency and mm-hmm. to be responsible and to have to show up. And I mean, I really realized I started drinking when I was 12 and pretty Holy shit. alcoholically by the time I was 15. <clears throat> And I... You were fucking 12. Yeah, I was oh young. I mean... Nobody was paying attention to you? No. And my parents got divorced right around that age. And, um, yeah, I started... I was off to the races, and then it was just... By the time I was 19, I was in... It was, It made a lot of sense. And I was in rehab for heroin. And then got off that, but that kind of not being, I use that as an excuse to be like, oh, I'm not an addict because I'm not doing heroin anymore. So I use that to stay out for a long time as an excuse of like, Mm. well, as long as I'm not doing heroin because anyone will get addicted to that. Mm. And so, yeah, I I mean, it was a long, long journey to sobriety. And then I, I was very miserable and somehow, and then around two years, like the rubber just started meeting the road. I got my first column at Playboy, I sold my first um, freelance writing piece. I started doing, you have so much energy when you get sober for somebody like me who is wasting a lot of it just drinking and partying that I just had to do a lot of different things. And I'll, I couldn't really deny that my quality of life improving drastically and starting to do things that I had always wanted to do, like be a paid writer it didn't seem like an accident that it was a couple of years after I had been sober that these things started happening. And so while it was happening, did you follow any protocol? Did you like, did you follow any advice from books? I was in 12 step, like full on in, in. But what, what, what didn't you like about that? What didn't you like about the 12 step? When I first left the 12 steps or just when I was in Just in general. Um, well, I have, you know, I had a lot of reason to think that abstinence isn't the only way, which they found isn't for everybody. Uh, it is for me because there's no middle ground with substance. I, I started smoking cigarettes in sobriety. This is a perfect example of how there's like no mid ground. And I was so mad because I quit everything. And I started smoking cigarettes in 2015. And I was, I had one cigarette at a meeting and I was like, all right, I'll have a cigarette. And then I was off to the fucking races, smoking pack a day within like weeks. I'm like, if this is any example of what I'll be like with booze or anything, I just know there's not, I do not, some people can be moderate 
They have that ability. And I envy the fuck out of it. So there's a difference between people who are alcoholics, like a, they have a genetic propensity to alcoholism, and then people who just get in these bad ruts. Right. I think I have, my grandfather was an alcoholic. I come from a long line of very high functioning alcoholics, or maybe not even high functioning. What is your nationality? Um, I'm French, Italian, and Irish, but I'm mostly Irish. The fucking Irish. I know. That part. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my family made it look, it was like a uh, the, our culture. <laughs> I have one alcoholic Don't in my family. Don't take my culture. My grandfather on my father's side, who is the Irishman. Okay. That's where I'm one quarter Irish. My grandfather on my father's side came from Ireland. He was a drunk. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I I tried everything. I tried everything, too. It wasn't like I was 20 anymore. I was 35, and I tried everything. So I, and it was just easier at that point. It's It was the, when I was trying to be moderate, like, I'm just going to have a glass of wine. I'm just going to have two glasses of wine. The amount <laughs> of energy that it takes me to do that, it's just a waste of energy. I actually am glad that I have an addiction that I can just remove because so many people with, like, behavioral addictions... That shit's hard. So explain to me like what it's like. So you ha you say I'm just gonna have a glass of wine, and then when you have that glass of wine, like what happens? I don't Shark know. Shark eyes. Like, it's like a, I'm like a gremlin. I don't. <laughs> it's like <laughs> two. You pour. It's like pouring water on a gremlin. I think it's when you feed them after midnight. It's whatever right? it is. When yeah. you pour water on, they multiply. They multiply. But when you it's also feed true. them. <laughs> <laughs> you feed him after midnight. I mean, I I don't know how I lived through all those years. Truly, I I do feel like serial killers were sleeping on the job through most of the like early aughts. I don't know how I I was so reckless, and it's dangerous as a woman. I don't I don't really know how I I made I it. I think through. there's a lot of people out there living like that though. <sighs> oh fuck! I mean, because there's so many people that lack structure and discipline and guidance, and then you add in the propensity to alcoholism that many people have. And then you add in the fact that, I mean, come on, what percentage of people go out and have a few drinks? Yeah. A huge percentage. Like, what percentage of people that work all day long and then the weekend rolls around and they get together with friends from the office, they go, let's go have a few drinks. God, That's fine. fucking 65, 75%. That's fine, though. But did you see the numbers during COVID of, like, alcoholism? Oh, yeah. It, it's crazy. People were just day drinking all day yeah. long. We played a video of this guy who was jogging through his neighborhood who was pointing out the recyclables. Oh, like, yeah. How many people? Did you ever see that video? I did see that. It's like, what the fuck is going on? This guy's like, everybody's getting drunk. Yeah. They're yeah. all hiding. I, I, I mean, I think that. Yeah, I would have one drink or say I was going to, I mean, here's a perfect example. One time I went out to my local, this was when I was living in LA and I was like, I'm just going to have one margarita. And we went to this local place, my friends and I, and the next thing I remember, I woke up and had like permanent marker written on my face and there was some dude sleeping in my place and... I mean, it was, and like my friend was there, passed out too. But I was like, "What happened?" What was the marker on your face? What did it say? I don't even remember what it said. It said something. I can't remember even what it said. It wasn't like slut or anything. I that happened when I was much younger. That happened to me when I was in high school, and my mom had to pick me up, and it was Mother's Day, and someone had written "slut" on my forehead oh. in permanent marker. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that should have been a sign to my mom that yeah. maybe things were going off the rails. Hey, but... mom, maybe you don't deserve an award. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you don't get a card this year. It should do better, mom. <laughs> <laughs> you fucked up, mom. Yeah, should have been there. Yeah. No, that it just, I think that there's, there's so much to all of it. This, my story is not original. There's a lot. I think there's an, there's a piece that I've been wanting to write for like years about how, um, I regret being a slut like there and I don't want to slut shame myself or anyone, but I really was like hypersexual for many of my years. And I thought that I could kind of sleep my way to empowerment. And it was such a lie that I told myself. And I see young women struggling with a lot of this stuff now. What do you mean by sleeping your way to empowerment? What do you like mean by there's that? this whole message of like you can kind of fuck whoever you want and like it's, you know, having sex like it, men get to do it and women can do it too. And I just, I I think that the 
the shame that I came into sobriety with, so much of it was around my sexual history and sexual life. And I think about how little self-esteem and self-worth, I mean, that was really what it got down to when I really started drilling down. And what I still wrestle with to a certain extent is just a feeling of it's way better, but at the core of it is worthlessness. And um, Did that, but that has to come from childhood, right? Um, or I, I shouldn't say has to. I but. mean, I think it's maybe starts there, but I don't. I don't know. It, a lot of it became choices that I was making that reinforced that idea. So maybe there's some stuff from childhood that you feel worthless for whatever reason. And I Which think being you, raised Catholic doesn't help always. No, but I mean, if you're being ignored to the extent that you're drinking at 12 and you're becoming a full-blown alcoholic at 15, clearly you're not getting the attention you need. Yeah. Kids need a certain amount of mentorship. They need a certain amount of independence and freedom, but they need a certain amount of love and attention. They yeah. Just, they just need it. I think we just had, we had a, uh, my dad traveled a lot, they got divorced, so there wasn't a real strong male figure in my life, and I think women do get a lot of that kind of self-esteem and from their father, or or a good male figure in their life, kind of telling them that they're, they're, and women, and from their mothers too, but really, I don't know, it seems like it does come from the male role model in their life, and then... My mom married my stepdad, and that was a shit show. It was just like um, he was mentally ill, and oh god, I never talk about any of this. It was, um, yeah, it, it was a, uh, it was a lot. It was like in and out of mental institutions, and we never knew what we were coming home to, and oh, a lot geez. of craziness. And um, she was caught up with him, you know, trying to deal with him and his. Uh, he took on a lot. He took on five kids. I'm the oldest of five. He was young when they got married. I don't know, which should have been the first sign that he was crazy. Um, <laughs> truly. Um, but, yeah, that was, and I think that everyone in the family suffered. You know, everyone, no one really came out of that environment unscathed. Um, but... We all, I, my siblings and I are all super close and we have supported one another and I'm like amazed at the lives they've built. We always joke. We're like, we did a horrible job raising our parents. (laughs) 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 We did a really bad job raising them, but we did. I mean, I think, yeah, probably raising yourself isn't a great thing for a teenage girl. And then I, I was, I was such a good kid. I was like straight-A student. I was like a child. I was seri- While you were an alcoholic? No. I mean, up to a certain point, it started falling apart. But we moved every year and a half. I managed to keep straight-A's. And I was, I was like on that fast track to Harvard. I wanted to go to an Ivy League school. And sh- it, shit gets hard when you're... That's what I feel like people sometimes don't understand. And a lot of people kind of in in the like elite media don't seem to understand this. If you're worried about your food or your parents or some shit going on at home, it gets hard to like pay attention to your homework and care about these things. Yeah. If your family system is out of control and you're not, and there's a lot of children in these kinds of environments. And Well, I'm, I'm concerned about the state of these institutions across the board anyway. Yeah. And but for sure, it's really hard for people to sustain that sort of a, a, any kind of an education schedule. Yeah, and it starts with... to seem petty. Yeah, like you're like, like oh, important. my yeah. stepdad threatened to like kill himself and is in a mental ward, and like I'm supposed to give a shit about my math homework. It right. just seems stupid, and my mom is like falling apart. So yeah. It just wasn't, um, it became less of a priority and then I didn't have anybody on me. But then because of that, I, I felt like it was my fault. And in some ways it was, and I started using drugs and alcohol to cope with just that environment. And I gave up on myself at like a very young age. And this is one of the things that I, I talk to a lot of teenagers and young 20 year olds and they have had challenges or been derailed from what they thought they were going to do and they're like well I'm 23 so I guess my life is over I'm like it's you're so young 
I want to shake you and tell you all if you I'm are in your 20s. But I know that feeling. I felt that way when I was 19 and in rehab, like I had just fucked up my whole life. And even though I was 19 and could have easily gone back to college and got a degree and had plenty of time, I was so disappointed in myself and I could not forgive myself for that or get over that disappointment. And then you just start burying yourself in more uh, shame. Shame is strong, man. Shame yeah. is shame will keep you in a cycle forever. Yeah. Yeah. And not having anything to boost your self-esteem, right? You didn't have anything that you were really particularly good at that you could go to and uh, invest all your time and energy into that. that would I mean, you... it, I might have, but it was, and that's like what a kind it? of, when you say you might have, I, I think that I was really into the arts and yeah, it's a, it's a, right, like, but you weren't getting feedback, right? You weren't doing no, something I where was, you're being successful at it on right. a regular basis. The one person who was supportive was my stepdad and he, it, it was like, it yeah. was not good. Right. You always say shit got weird. Yeah, the arts. <laughs> like, what do you mean by the arts? I mean, I was acting, and I was like, wanted to be a writer, and was very into all that stuff. And I was going to film school for a minute after I got out of rehab, and I really loved all of that. And I think had I had some support, even when I got out of rehab, that I could have continued that. But um, yeah, I think <clears throat> if you don't have the, you need support from people, and you need encouragement, like you said, and then. I, that's one of the reasons, though, that I do value my self-esteem so much because it, it's been built like brick by brick from scratch <laughs> on my own. And you're such a good friend. I mean, you really you do notice when I'm like not in a good place. And you'll reach out and be like, are you OK? <laughs> well, like, I, I know you tweeting some weird things. <laughs> I know your waves, you know, and I love you. So when things are weird with you. Uh, there, I mean, there are times where it gets, it's definitely, it's, it's, I'm competing against people who had what I wanted. What do you mean? And even in like the, the think piece and even in the space of like the writers and the people who are writing these columns and sub stacks and all these things, not so much in comedy, but in, in the writing world, it's like all academics and people who generally went to colleges and they seem like they had loving parents <laughs> and support yeah and i sometimes feel like i don't belong in that world you oh, know i, so ha I Listen, have like imposter syndrome me, that's crazy you can't think like that you uh you're a brilliant writer and you write really interesting shit and it's funny and it's it's Thank insightful <laughs> And I don't think you can think about what other people are doing. I no, don't think you not. should compare yourself to them people. I don't think you should ever say, you know, I'm competing with them. Well, I think it's like I feel like I I don't have the like pedigree to be in the nonsense. in the space. Not, neither did Bukowski. Like <laughs> some of the best writers ever were just interesting people. Like, I'm just being honest. I understand what you're saying, but I think it's that's a bad pattern. <laughs> it's a bad pattern to uh, to to nurse in your head. Yeah, don't I? I don't, don't nurse it. it. I'm okay. just being honest about when you sense those moments. That's what it those is. Those cycles. It's me feeling like imposter syndrome. Like, what am I doing? Uh, see, imposter syndrome never goes away, kid. I have it still. Really? Yeah. For what? Everything. <laughs> everything. Everything I've Maybe. done. Everything. I used to have it when I fought. I used to have it when, uh, uh, you know, like I have it with comedy, I have it with podcasting, I have it with UFC, I have it with everything. That's it's, fascinating it's, to me. It's part of being a person who is ruthlessly introspective mm -hmm. and is constantly analyzing the work that you do and constantly trying to fix it and make it better and and doing a lot of self auditing like I'm all, uh, yeah. with everything with everything I do. I'm, I mean I'm that's a, part of it too is I'm just very hard on myself. Yeah. Not even I'm competing mostly with myself. That's why you're good. <laughs> that's just that's part of the the thing. The, the sooner you realize that that we all do that, the better off you'll be. <laughs> I was laughing so hard though. You were checking on me once when I was <laughs> tweeting about I was like, I just Googled how to get rid of my jowls and you're like, Are you okay? And I'm like, Well now I really feel like a loser. <laughs> Like nothing will make you feel like a loser. <laughs> and then like uh, I'm not okay. Clearly, <laughs> I'm googling how to get rid of my jowls. <laughs> but it, it, I, I'm also honest about. I'm. I try to be very honest about those struggles because I know I'm not alone. No. I know so many people. 
Yeah, we're not alone. No, but and no I, one's alone. Yeah, I, I can't this... project like that. I just don't have. I I sometimes look at the confidence that you have. People, who, I'm like, where do you get this? I, I, it's a different thing. It's not necessarily like like people think of confidence as being like. There's no. It's almost like if you have a pie chart, right? And how much of you believes you can do it? If it's ever a hundred percent, you're a psychopath. <laughs> it's True. not a hundred. <clears throat> it's there's a lot going on on that pie chart. Right. The thing is, like, what do you concentrate on? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I concentrate on the process and yeah. how much work I've done. Like, the thing that gives me confidence <clears throat> before I do a stand-up show or anything is that I put in the work. Right. That's the thing that gives me confidence. Right. That I've done a lot of practice shows, you know, that I, I constantly work in town. Before I do these arena shows, I constantly go over my notes. Mm-hmm. I don't just wing it. Yeah. Like I, and if I don't do that, then I will, then I will really... F- feel like a piece of shit right because i'm like you have all these opportunities and then you're not putting in the work right like right you, you're half-assing this you can't half ass so as long as i don't half-ass it then i know i can do it but i it still feels crazy yeah everything feels crazy oh, yeah. everything from the success of the podcast to going on stage in front of fucking sixteen thousand people all that it feels fucking insane it doesn't feel real that's amazing though right before i, I do it i'm like this can't be real i love seeing those videos i They're love so them bizarre I know, but it's it's so exciting because you're. I actually think you're a good person, and you deserve your success. And I know you work very hard for it. You're one of the hardest working people I know, and you're dedicated to your process. And you're not just full of shit. You know, there there's there's like this. The one of the jokes I used to always tell is about how in the secret the guy is like, you know, and I just had this idea for a book, and then I envisioned the checks coming in the mail. <laughs> And the checks just showed up. And I'm like, yeah, you wrote the fucking book in between that. That's like where most yeah. people get tripped up is doing that work and setting those habits and being yeah. hard on yourself and working out and being mm-hmm. diligent. And and having some talent, too. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are just whatever it is, their brain just doesn't fit the square peg into the square hole. It's just like, earth, earth. <laughs> <laughs> they just, you know, there's some people that just don't get, you have to have some kind of talent, but that secret thing used to drive me fucking <laughs> crazy. It used to drive me so mental. This is a sad story. It's not sad, but it's kind of sad. There was a girl who used to come to the comedy store. She was very nice. I think she was a friend of Kelly Kirsten's. And so she, uh, she came around. We were all hanging out, and uh, it was like a normal night. Everything was normal. You know, it wasn't anything crazy. I don't even think she was drunk. Mm-hmm. And she goes, I'm so happy. <laughs> and I go, okay, why are you happy? And she goes, because I know that I am going to have the perfect career. I know that uh, I'm going to be in the perfect relationship. And I know that everything's going to work out. And I said, how do you know that? And she goes, I know because I've been reading The Secret. Oh, God. And I, and I just like... It was like the the record skipped. Like, yeah. Oh, you poor kid. <laughs> she was so nice though. Like I didn't have the heart to tell her. You know, I didn't I didn't want to dash her dreams. It was one of the rare moments where I didn't feel like dashing someone's dreams. <laughs> so I remember saying, "Well, good luck." And because I had a friend of mine who was into that too. He was like he was a musician and he's he was envisioning himself in front of twenty five thousand people. Rock. Like he had all these these Did it ideas. Work? No, it didn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Like I. This is what I. So this is a story. So this, but I'm telling you, this girl was like locked in. Mm-hmm. She believed, and so I didn't see her for a good solid year and a half, maybe more. And then the next time I saw her was at the UCB, uh, and uh, I was outside, and I was about to go in, and I ran into her. She's coming to the show. I go, "Hey, what's up? How you doing? How's it been?" And she's like, "It's just not going like I thought it was going to go. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not." Everything's not going. I go. The last time I talked to you, you were telling me about the secret and all that stuff. And she goes, "Yeah, I don't know why, but it's just not working. <laughs> and my father's an asshole, and I can't. You know, the, my job is not working. I can't get the career I wanted. And I still didn't have the heart to tell her because she was nice and she's a little naive. But my perspective on these things is always: you can't listen to someone who succeeded and say that the reason why they did it is because they believed and then they had a vision and they manifested it through the the power of attraction the law of attraction that's not real (laughs) when you're only talking to winners 
if you could talk to everyone right, who right, had a dream, right. like acting is the best example, right? Because acting is probably the number one most failed at right. attempt in careers, especially in Hollywood, which is one of the weirder things about living in Los Angeles is that whether you know it or not, you're around failed actors. Like there's a lot of my wife's former friends like that, you know, you would dig below the surface and then you'd find, oh, they came out here to be an actor. Right. And I think there's this false sense that you can make it because the like the opposite of that is that you're always surrounded by people who have made it. Yeah. So there's you're always surrounded by failed actors. But as these actors who are trying to make it, they know someone who knows someone who did or they're, they're friends with someone who's making it. And so there's this false idea that you know everybody can and then what fucked it up even worse is reality shows because then you didn't even have to have talent <laughs> then there's this injection yeah. of new possibility just so you could make it for no fucking reason whatsoever yeah it was almost like a magic trick like all of a sudden like we found a hack to the system you got the cheat code you got the god code and mm -hmm. now, now you can run through the video game without getting shot like what you don't even have to have talent <laughs> no auditions at all no auditions at all I mean, you audition i think you just smack <laughs> people in the face on tv and spill <laughs> wine over someone's head and next thing you know you're a fucking star no, baby they they not only audition you they psychologically profile you oh yeah they want you to be crazy yeah, yeah. i've gone through these i have yeah i'm sure you have <laughs> I was going to be on The Real World when I was like 23. I made it all the way oh to the final God. round. Thank so, God I didn't. Thank God man, you didn't. I would be dead. You'd be fine. Theo Vaughn made it through. So <laughs> my, my point about it was that like these people that think that just because someone is successful and they'll tell you what I did was I put a photograph on the, I sound like The Rock. <laughs> I put a photograph on the wall of me walking the red carpet. <laughs> I took a photo of a house. That's going to be my home on the top of a hill. Like they have all these ideas. Like vision boards. Yeah, vision yep. boards. But what's going on is these are people that did all the right things and also had a vision. Right. But they did all the right things. And luck. And luck. Luck is luck. a big. It's a big factor. And yep. not having bad luck, even if you don't have good luck, not having, not getting hit by a car while you're jogging. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of shit that goes wrong with people. That's just bad luck. Yeah. So it's not just good luck has to happen. Bad luck has to not happen. Yeah. So if you're talking to these fucking assholes that are like, I've got my own jet, and the reason why is because I used the power of positive <laughs> attraction. The law of attraction led me to victory, and I can help you. Yeah. You know, like those people are assholes. Yeah. Because you're, you're telling people that there's a simple solution to one of the most complex, nuanced problems. Trying to be successful in this open-ended world of possibilities. Yeah. Especially in something that is re like has a very small percentage of people that are actually successful at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 a very small. <laughs> very small. It's almost like, you know, there's this narrative that stand-up comedy is one of the most difficult jobs in all of show business. But I almost want to say it's not. And this is why. Because at least you get a chance to try and practice. It's one of the rare art forms where you you may not make any money at it for a long time, but there's opportunities at open mic nights where you can practice right. and you get to communicate with other comics. Like one one of the things about comics I find is that generally the the nice ones, the good ones, are willing to talk to people that are on the way up and right. give them advice because it's so hard. You're one of the few. I don't think you think so, Joe. You have the benefit of everyone treating you like. <laughs> Joe Rogan. <laughs> so I'm not sure you always see like how people treat other people. I don't know that everybody is like that. You know, I, I, I think you're one of the few. I don't, I don't, there are, are many, there are, are some, but I don't, I don't know that that's common. I think it's, I think for sure I do it a lot and I do it on purpose, but I think it's rubbed off on a lot of people too. And I know a lot of other comics that I'm friends with that do it as well. Yeah. So I'm speaking out of my circle. Like my, yeah, yeah. my my circle of friends are very good at it. Like Ari Shafir is amazing. Ari's at it. amazing. He's amazing at yep. it. He was just posting this incredible bit of Shane Gillis's. It's on his Instagram right now. Yep. And Ar he's Ar so Ar supportive great. of my favorite comedian, Adrian Apolucci, yes, in the entire he world. And he he's is. a huge fan of hers and has she always talks about just how great he is and how great he's been and she is truly 
truly one of the funniest people out there right now. Yes, yeah, she's really, really funny. Just, vi- I mean, she does, there's no, hits every third rail. It's yeah. crazy. No, she's wild. <laughs> and Ari is a, a giant supporter of her. Um, Mark Norman, he's a giant supporter. I love Mark. Of, he's a, he's a, Ari, he, he took the torch. He really did. Yeah. He, he followed that example. I agree. And, and yep. he has great instincts as far as like supporting the art. Um, but you can be an amateur and make it. Like, yeah. You can do it. Like, I think it's probably the path is clearer for that than it is for acting. Oh God. Acting's acting so hard. It's, but it, it's so crazy because you get chosen. Ugh. You have to. That's why they all have no opinions. That's what I love about stand up is no yes. one can stop you. Right. You no one's stopping you from getting up and trying things out, and there's no gatekeepers really at all. Right. And with acting, there's still a lot of gatekeeping that goes on. If you're funny, like I was having this conversation with Ali Wong, and she agreed. We were like, I think it's a meritocracy. Like it's one of the rare meritocracies. Like if you're a killer, if you go up there and just fucking murder, people are like, holy shit, they, they want to use you. Yeah. And they want you to do more shows because the audience loves you and they want to, when are you going to be here again? And they want to bring their friends. That's a meritocracy. Yeah, it, yeah. It really, it, in, in some ways, it's not pure, right? There's clearly people get ahead when they shouldn't because they're friends with people or they schmooze or. Yeah. I mean, I also do, <laughs> being that, um, I mean, speaking of Ali Wong, I love her so much because especially with like her specials, Fully Pregnant, I'm Hilarious. like, oh my God. Two of them. Two of them. She must fuck a lot. <laughs> Just two of them up there. Just. I'm it's like, like, how do you time that? I wonder if she did the second one on purpose after the, the first one was so successful being pregnant. But I do, being that I'm pregnant, <laughs> I was like in that first um I'm announcing this right now. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Now you've just told the world. Yes. Instead of a I'm, gender said, reveal party, I'm, I'm going to I'm burning down California. I'm going to do a gender <laughs> reveal podcast. Yeah, just <laughs> just spray pink flammable fluid yeah. everywhere. <laughs> it's a girl. Um yeah, being that in that first trimester I was like, "Oh, this is why there aren't women in everything (laughs) not as many women you know when you talk about it and i was thinking about just doing comedy i'm like oh my god how did ali and all these other women who have done this and when you're feeling sick and hormonal and you want to you want to get on stage and cry and you're actually just like you're i i was like that i don't know how women do it ever anything and have other kids that they have to deal with when they're feeling sick and working yeah yeah it's i mean women are badasses well if men just had to women if men just had to work carrying a fucking 45 pound backpack (laughs) you know i mean if every if you had a regular job right and now you have to do the regular job with a 45 pound backpack yeah then you would realize like oh my god this is crazy yeah it, it makes me realize why uh there it's in particular just like comedy that it still is predominantly male i think still well i think women have a really good shot at it if they're funny because there's not that many of them but if they do decide to have a family then it gets much more complicated yeah much much more complicated yeah how are you gonna you tour <laughs> how are you gonna tour and take care of the babies the only, I've, one thing that i've seen people do that's kind of interesting is like male and female comics get together and they have a baby and then they decide like okay you go out this weekend oh, i'll go okay. out that like, like tom and christina do yeah that. that i remember yeah. seeing christina up at the comedy store right after she had a baby and she was freaking hilarious she had she's like i haven't left my house i'm losing my fucking mind <laughs> i was like <laughs> She's there's like, a, I'm there's fucking a woman. losing it. She's fucking funny. I know. I love her. I, I love Pazisky. them both. I love them both too. I worked with Tom last night. He uh, was on the show with Dave and I. Okay. And Donnell and uh, Jeff Ross. It was it was amazing. But Christina is one of the best comics alive. Yeah, she, she's hilarious. And she's so insightful. She's hilarious on her podcast yeah. too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I no. just love them. She's awesome. She's got it. She's got insight. Like yep. she sees things. Yeah. Like and she points things out. And also like she doesn't tolerate any nonsense. No. She's a no nonsense person. Like, you know, like people like she sends me some hilarious sh- shit, like memes and stuff or yeah. stories in the news. Like, what the fuck is this? You know, yeah, she's 
you know, she came from these old school European parents. Yeah, you know, it's they're like, the best. Yeah, like the hardworking <laughs> people that just they raise you like that. And she doesn't. There's no nonsense in her. I think it makes you a good parent, though. Too, <laughs> it's yeah, like you because you're not tolerating as much. Yeah, you know. But I do want to shout out the very small business that made this sweatshirt for me. Squid Print DGT. They're direct to garment printing. I love small businesses, as you know, and I should give them credit because they are amazing. Well, I'm on the side of the government. I'd like all small businesses to <laughs> fold and Target to take over everything. They're getting crushed by yeah. inflation and the supply. She was talking the other day. It's it, cost her okay. $10,000 in two months between the inflation and the supply stuff and the pandemic and the shutdown. Let me ask you, because you probably are aware of this. What the fuck is going on? Like, what is this supply chain problem? Why are there so many boats off the coast of California? Because someone told me it's a half a million cargo ships yeah. off the coast of California. A friend of I'm mine said- I'm not sure what the numbers are. In the, I know that there was a great thread that I retweeted the other day. A guy went in and was like, here's what's actually going on. And I know a lot what of it. Say? Well, one of the biggest problems is the bottleneck is zoning. It has something to do with containers and they can't stack the containers. And, um, and I do think California. there's a trucking problem as well. Part of it being that they did that, you know, the whole pro act thing, not pro act, I guess it was the AB five, which we've talked about before when they, that affected truckers as independent contractors. AB5 to people, please. So it, it was about categorizing independent contractors as workers, basically. So if you worked a certain number of hours, you needed to be considered brought on as an employee and it made it very hard for people to hire anybody if you were a corporation because you couldn't hire independent contractors. There, It was such a bad law bill. They had to do carve outs for basically everyone. They should have just repealed it. It was horrible. It's the one that woman, Lorena Gonzalez, who is like fucking Elon Musk on Twitter. And then he left. <laughs> but she's the wo woman. What? What are you she, this, she's the, like an assembly woman in California and she's behind this bill AB5. She said fuck Elon Musk? Yeah, on Twitter. And then she left? What do you mean? And then he left. I he mean, left he's what? left California with all oh, of his business. Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I guess we know how that worked out. Um, but so she... I doubt he left because of her. No, I'm kidding. I was confused. Um, I, I was just, it was like one of those, how, how it, you know, like how it's, how it was, how it's been, how it's going. It's yeah. like her and now started, he's like, I'm out of here. Yeah. yeah. And she Well you were, it affected you because of, of writing. Well then they did I think they did another carve out, but yeah, you people couldn't hire me because I couldn't ten ninety nine then they would have had to put me if you write a certain number of articles, it affected everybody. And hairdressers, people who really needed to be independent contractors. The problem I have with this push against independent contractors and now Pro Act, which is the federal version of this, which they keep trying to push through is that people like to be independent contractors. They act like they're being forced into this, right. this agreement when many people like to be able to choose when they want to work or when they want to drive. So this was really brought about because of Uber and Lyft, and they were saying that they were abusing them and they needed to put bring them on and Postmates. And obviously many of these companies do take advantage of this situation and they do, you know, you will hear from an Uber driver how much they're, they're getting screwed. Yeah. So well, I the, think the, there needs to be something, but I don't think that me the whole concept of Uber is that you aren't an employee. Right. Like there's, there's certainly room for independent operators in, in, in a host of different jobs. And when you overregulate like that, when you think you're helping people out and you wind up hurting people, they have to change the law. Like, why don't they repeal it? I don't know. It it was it started a lot of people. A lot of people I knew left California before the pandemic because of AB5. Single mothers, many people who were affected by it. It affected people who were working, people with disabilities who were able to be independent contractors. I mean, a lot of people have side gigs for that reason. And now because they can save money for college for their kids or whatever and they don't they don't want to go work for 8 hours on and have to clock yeah, in. Obviously. 
And it just, it's something so, that's very infuriating so to me. So that is why, so that, that, isn't there something also that has to do with the age of the trucks? Like, didn't they pass a regulation say that trucks can only be a certain Oh, I don't age? know anything about that. I mean, I know it seems to be like a confluence of fuckery that's yeah. causing this. And But mostly in California. Mostly in California. Because in Florida, they just opened up their ports and Ron DeSantis was on TV basically saying, come on over. Right. Come on over and but open like, up your what, ships. But you're going to go through the Panama Canal? I mean, I don't even know what that would cost. Well, he wants to change the way people ship to ship through Florida mm. instead and saying, listen, it's it's available. And then also, he's also giving $5,000 to every police officer that relocates to Florida. Yeah, I saw that. Isn't that wild? Because I mean, they're Because fi- they're firing all these fucking cops. And he's saying, not only will I hire you, but I'll give you $5,000 yeah, to relocate to Florida. And I think he was being misrepresented because they were saying he was like, only the unvaccinated. But he was making the offer to anybody in law enforcement, a, oh a police God. officer, not just the unvaccinated ones. Who said ones. that? Just on Twitter, they were saying, "Oh, like he there was he was being misrepresented, obviously by like news organizations. Like DeSantis, you know, says he will give like five thousand dollars to the unvaccinated police officers, but it's like the, he'll give it to anybody who wants to come." Right. Well, the, well, the the conceit is that most of these people that are getting fired are unvaccinated. So the back to the shipping. I'm not an expert in this. There's there's many people who, I it's shocking actually how little. Um, information that you can get but this one guy who just like has a business when went and rented a boat and like talked to people for hours about what the problem was and within hours of him doing this thread that went viral um, they had relaxed the zoning laws in Long Beach to help with this bottleneck which is part of the problem and oh yes thank you Yesterday, I rented a boat and took the leader of (laughs) Flexport's partners in Long Beach for a three hour of the, I guess that tour, three hour tour (laughs) of the port complex. Here's a thread about what I learned. So everyone should read that and it's really fascinating. Give me a little bit of it. It says, uh, first off, the boat captain said we were the first company to ever rent his boat to tour the port to see how everything was working up close. His usual business is doing the memorial services at sea. He said, okay, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the ports of L.A. Long Beach are at a standstill. In a full three-hour loop through the port complex, passing every single terminal, we saw less than a dozen containers get unloaded. There are hundreds of cranes. I counted only seven that were, uh, were even operating, and those that were seemed to be going pretty slow. It seemed that everyone now agrees the bottleneck yard is yard space at the container terminals. The terminals are simply overflowing with containers, which means they no longer have space to take in new containers, either from ships or land. It's a true traffic jam. Right now, if you have a chassis with no empty container on it, you can, uh, by the way, this guy's name is Types Fast on Twitter. His name is Ryan Peterson and his handle is Types Fast. Uh, You can go pick up containers at any port terminal. However, if you have an empty container on that chassis, they are not allowing you to return it except on on a highly restricted basis. Uh, If you can't get the empty off the chassis, you don't have a chassis to go pick up the next container. And if nobody goes to pick up the next container, the port remains jammed. I mean, it's crazy. He, he goes on and on. It's What's like, crazy is that Pete Buttigieg during this whole time is on paternity <laughs> leave. And you just want to go, listen, man, I understand it's hard to raise a child, but um, isn't that supposed to be for the person who gave birth? It's crazy. Yeah, men you're take right. Paternity now leave? over 70 ships containing 500,000 containers are waiting offshore. Sh- 500,000. But he right. was saying this, like something. this negative feedback loop that is rapidly cycling out of control that if it continues unabated will destroy the global economy. I'm like, that's a nice one to just slide in there. Okay. Yeah. It. Um, so Fucked. it's complicated, Fucked. but I do know the trucking stuff has something to do with it too because there was already problems with truckers. They kind of abandoned California. What does it look like two years ago? This is a visualization of like the data they used. So on we're a map. watching trucks just a or couple, ships a come couple in. Ships. You know, just like a couple 10. ships. This is 2019. This is last week. Why are there so many? Because they're all stuck. I mean, stuck. This, this is why. Oh, that's they, why. Yeah. Because they're, they're stuck. Yeah, they're all floating around out here, waiting to find space to come into there to go wait, and they can kind of get in there. Like you said, if there's only seven out of hundreds of cranes emptying them, then uh, they're waiting. It's nuts. Yeah. Oh. It's nuts. And that's why you can't buy toys. 
And it's also <laughs> affecting small businesses. Yeah. You know, the, it's just that it definitely feels like a clusterfuck. And now, I think. But who's responsible? Is this like people are blaming Pete Buttigieg because of the, the fact that why? he's on paternity leave? They're it, saying he's the secretary of transportation. Oh, Does okay. that make any sense? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, that that was a weird one because I never know when those stories, it's like, uh, is this just like a partisan thing where you just right. want to like yell at the guy because. But it is kind of crazy. He's on <laughs> it is. The craziest thing to me was the picture of them in the fucking hospital bed. Yeah. That's where I was like. Like it's just like you didn't you weren't in a hospital. I mean, maybe I don't know if they well, were there for the they you had know foot surgery <laughs> for the birth. Maybe the 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 you know surrogate was, but it wasn't but like on the, they were in right. the hospital. They were they were on the bed <sighs> where women give birth. Yeah, it, right? just, it was like a the, birthing table. Yeah, see, that is that's what's weird. Yeah, that was a little bit much for me. But it's like here. But here's the thing. <laughs> One of you should do that. One of you should take care of the children. Like this idea that both parents should get maternity and paternity leave at the same time is a little weird. I don't think so. You don't I don't. Think so? I don't. Only Why? because I have a German cousin and they get the shit. I mean, they get like a full year for the woman and okay. nine months for the husband. That's great. You want to live in Germany? Because in America, <laughs> you got to work. Like, here's the thing. If you have a small business, you're the one who loves small businesses. Okay. Right. Yeah. You love, imagine. No, if you, you can't take paternity leave. Uh, <laughs> imagine. If you have an employee and this is your like your fucking CEO of your little company or whatever and they uh, they the wife has a baby and the husband's like I'm taking four months off you're like what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about I need paternity leave like he's been off since <laughs> August <laughs> that's crazy yeah, yeah I mean I, yeah, I think thank it's, you I, it's a I don't crazy. know I don't live in Germany I'm not it's interesting it is it's interesting I th- what boggles my mind is why conservatives aren't all over maternity leave. Like that seems like a no brainer for the, the conservative side because they want business. They want businesses to operate. Right. But you still if you're if everybody should be in support of like a woman shouldn't have to lose her job if she has a baby. If you're going to be supportive of women having children and you want women or to encourage women to have children, you have to give them some support in the aftermath of giving birth to a fucking baby. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree as a like a social thing and as for society, for our culture, for community. For it's the very baby. Important. However, if you're running a business and then you have to pay someone and they're not there because they decided to have a baby. This is the reason why men are more likely to get hired for certain roles because they're worried. Men can have babies, Joe. Uh, sure. <laughs> Women. <laughs> Women. <laughs> I mean, it's like if you right. I, I'm not in. This is again. Uh, this is not my argument. I'm not for this. But what I'm saying is, if you're a person who is looking to hire someone for a job, and you're hiring a woman who is trying to get pregnant. And then you're going to have to pay her, but you still need the job done. But now you're paying her and she's not there. Like, unless this is some sort of a national program right. where our tax well, dollars right. go In to Germany, subsidize. In Germany, it is national. That's my point. Right. That's my point. So this is the difference. When you're talk well, with Pete Buttigieg, I mean, I don't know what the, what his deal is, but I don't know if he has anything to do with the, the shipping issue. <laughs> but what I had read was that, like, how was he, you know, and again, this is from hardcore Republicans that were tweeting this kind of right, stuff right. and writing these kind of articles. I'm skeptical. But my thing is, like, you didn't give birth. Right. Like, you, you're on... <laughs> I know you, but should the dad be able to take off work too? Like, again, the dad should have a role in raising the child. But it is a, a situation where, like, what is, what's the the right protocol? Google, like, should a dad Google, be able to take off three months to take care of I mean, a kid? Google gives paternity leave, They're like, wild. three months. First of all, they've got more money than God. Those crazy fucks. But I mean, they I, probably I, just you know, pay people. It's not and, just about, like, the baby. The mom needs support in, in the aftermath of for giving sure. birth. Oh, it's, 100%. It's not just, like, to bond with the kid. I think a lot of mothers need... I, I don't know. We You know, so, so much of this is just a question of... Um, it feels like we don't have the same social 
cohesion and family structures that we used to have where you would be living close to your family and family right. would help you take care of the baby Mom and they come over come and over, your mother-in-law right, and right. you had all this support and now people who are living in cities and working for these massive corporations and they for don't the massive corporations all this makes sense to me right but when you're dealing with like this a is small why business. when things get weird it's like right. okay small business okay but then what if it's someone has a significant role like a really important role right. in like government or a really important role in 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 something that's very I, important. I'm just thinking even from my own personal circumstance, if my right hand woman, Maggie, who's like my co producer on everything and works for me. What if she wanted you to pay her? If, if she, she had, had a baby, to take off I'd be fucked. <laughs> what if she wanted you to pay her? <laughs> I'd be I would. I mean I want to be supportive for four but months? I would be How many fucked. Months? How many months would you give her free money? I I mean, I don't know. I know. See, I probably this is it. This I, is... That's the thing because so I'm I'm so I think you and I are very similar in that we come from the left and I'm I think people need support. I'm I'm still such a bleeding heart lefty, but I'm also a small business owner and know many small business owners. And, and you're also a realist. And I'm also a realist. And I see the damage of giving away free money in beloved California and <laughs> know that that doesn't always work out the way you want. Like the law of un unintended consequences is very real. And so I'm, I don't know, but on a personal level, I want to support women having kids and I want to make it so that they don't feel worried about losing your job and can spend those early months just doting on their child. And I, I think the family and systems nurturing and child, nurturing their child. On. And I think that the, the, that is one of the things that's lacking in our country right now is that, you know, family core structure. Yes. <laughs> and how can I be supportive of that if, if I'm not supportive of something like maternity? Well, the reality is that, Raising a child is a job, right? In oh, and of it's itself. a fucking huge job. It is a job. Stay, so stay at home moms don't get enough credit. Okay, so the idea <laughs> that you're supposed to be able to have a full time job as well as have that job, and neither one is going to suffer, is mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Yeah, it's not. It's not real. But that we've we've been sold this, and I think part of it is because we don't value things that don't produce tangible monetary results. Right. Right. So we don't think of but a isn't woman. This like this is America. You got to work. <laughs> it's like it's an also this is America where we, we love each other. Yeah. Right. It's it should be both things. Like you should understand that like a woman's job of raising a child is a hugely significant job and it's just because it doesn't have numbers in a bank account that correspond to each individual activity that you do doesn't mean it's not valuable it's massively put massively numbers valuable. on it put numbers on don't put numbers on it no rethink I mean, the way you look at rethink it. rethink the way you look at it but if you need to put numbers on it why don't you figure out what you would have to pay for somebody to do every single thing that the mother is doing from driving the kids around which takes up a huge amount of their of time to but, all that stuff but if you're a business owner Whose responsibility is that? Are you responsible for that? Per is that person your child now? Like this person who you employed, like say if you have someone employed, you employ them, they work for you for four or five months and they get knocked up. Well, most companies have minimums. So you would have to be, um, like my husband's at a new company and I think he's eligible for some amount whether he takes it or not, I don't know. But he can have paternity leave too. I think that he might be eligible, but it's. Do they he, frown upon that? He has to be Male there for like a leave? year. Did you give birth there, Bob? <laughs> How did it go? Was it painful, Bob? I Need just, time off to heal? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I Do mean, they get shit support on? the. I don't think so. I don't know. I bet they do. Not where I, I, I mean, like, Bob, you ready to come back yet? He's a therapist. You ready to come back yet, Bob? I'm not talking about your husband <laughs> specifically, but I think guys that take time off for paternity leave, I guarantee they get shit on. I don't think at Google they're getting shit on. <sighs> Google is a communist, <laughs> communist-run <laughs> empire. I don't know who of pays data for data collection, it, but I do know that I want to be supportive of the family. Google should hand out all of that money that they stole. <laughs> 
as as freely as possible because they've been stealing money from people by by snatching up their data. So you don't think people should get paternity leave? I didn't say that. You what, are you, what are you fucking that lady you interviewed, Jordan Peterson? <laughs> no, I'm just. That lady? Qu- I'm asking. So what you, you mean is? <laughs> so if so I what you're saying correctly, is, no, I'm just playing devil's advocate. No, I know you are. I'm and I'm questioning what. Who do you believe? should pay for something like that. I don't know, but if I was an employer and I had a guy who worked for me, I had a guy who worked for me who wanted to take three months off because his wife gave birth, I'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about, Mike? (laughs) Even to support his wife? Did you give birth? To support his wife, I pay him for free. (laughs) Do you understand that this is kind of, most people, when this happens, if they make enough money, the wife will not work and the father will work. Right. And then the wife takes care of the child. And this is normal. Yeah. And then the dad provides support when he comes home. If you're saying that the man and the woman should both get like three months off, this is a new thing. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's not new in Europe, but we're not in Europe. (laughs) This is better. This is America. I'm right? playing devil's advocate. You know what I'm saying, though. This is we're not in Europe, and th- for America, this is a new concept. Right. Right. So when someone in government, no. I mean, d- look, it's interesting because it starts this conversation. When someone in government who's a man who didn't give birth, and they there's two of them, and they both are off work, and they you know they get free money or what happens? <laughs> are, are we they paying working? for maybe his he's paternity working on Zoom. leave? Maybe we're maybe we're incorrect. Maybe he's working on Zoom. I don't know. Are we, but, are we paying for the paternity leave? Well, we're paying for a lot of shit, <laughs> right? We're paying for puppies to get tortured. <laughs> that's that's literally tax Americans dollar funded. Americans pay for a lot of shit. That is true. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting conversation no, of who's is. responsible. It's a, particularly if you're a small business. If you have less than, like, if you have someone who has a critical role in your company and it's a man and the man's wife gives birth and then the man wants to take three months off and wants you to pay him, he'd be like, what? <laughs> Right? Wouldn't you? I'm I'm really trying to think. What is my I really don't know. You yeah, know, it's something I, I, I really hadn't Maybe you should move to Germany, it. Mike. <laughs> right now. Go ahead, move to Germany, but they'll let you take three months I know off. My cousin's husband got like nine months off. Oh God. <laughs> is that in Germany? Yeah. Yeah, well that's why their economy's fucked. I well, mean, they were too. doing well, but I'm not sure what too. it's like now. Were they? Well, because they make Mercedes and BMWs. The, and shit. It's just they—they they have a. Th- this is something I've learned too from a lot of my European friends around, like all this vaccine stuff, is that there's they're much more. Um, like I think it is just coming from socialism and with lots of deep roots and like communism and fascism. There's a more. Um, they're more concerned about the group. My friend in Italy was like, we don't have, I mean, I know there are Italians who are protesting, but she's like, for the most part, everyone's just like, oh, I got to do my part. And there's not like this whole thing. Yeah. Um. So it does seem like. Got to do my part about what? Like getting the vaccine are for the good Are you seeing what's of, going on in Italy? Yeah, no, I they're see. They're hiding it. Do you know that? <laughs> I know. I know. Do you know I've, I've seen what's going on in Italy. But did you see that they they had town ca- they had cameras that show like this area where the protests were having, and they were showing fake images. <laughs> did, did you see <laughs> yeah, that? I saw because that. Because it was so overrun with people that when they were reporting it, they were showing fake images. Yeah, it's very it's very strange in Europe. They do a good job of hiding all of the resistance to this, so yeah. they make well, it Italy. seem like they're yeah. They're more socially coherent, cohesive, coherent than they might be. I I don't know. It just it's a fascinating and and crazy time to be. Um, I'm I'm very much like an individualist, you know, Amer- American to my core. I think in that respect. Yeah. Where I am, like Randy and South Park, where I'm like, I'm sorry, I thought this is America. I don't need to <laughs> fucking take a vaccine. And I have been so anti-mandates and vax ports and all these things and i'm vaccinated <laughs> sort of you're sort of vaccinated you got vaccinated with the johnson and johnson and it barely worked just did the antibody test and, like, and you lost your period for a couple of years <laughs> that's what's so crazy about being pregnant is that so can i tell this story yeah okay so we i was told first of all i was thinking about this on my way over here this is the second time I've been pregnant on your show. The first time I ever did your show, I was pregnant and didn't know it, and it ended up being ectopic, which for people who don't know, 
it's like a suicide bomber in your body. <laughs> it's basically a, a tubal or ovarian pregnancy, and it would have killed me like 100 years ago, and it still kills a lot of women. It's super dangerous, and it's like a baby that's like, if I'm not going to be born, I'm taking you with me. Can I ask you a question here? Is this um, carved out? I know Texas has a really <laughs> fucked up abortion law yeah. that they just passed. Is that carved out in the abortion law that you can have an abortion <sighs> if there's... You don't a have an abortion. So you would lose an ovary or a fallopian tube, except now, and this is where I'm like, okay, big pharma, thanks, I guess. Um, what mine was treated with, I found out early enough. I, I, It was like three weeks after, it was on my birthday. It was like three weeks after I was on your show the very first time in 2019. And I kept getting a shooting pain, and I was like, I think I have a fucking ectopic pregnancy. And it's so rare. Everyone's like, you're crazy, Bridget. I was like, no, I don't know why. I just have this what feeling. What is the term? How do you say it? Ectop ectopic. Ectopic? Yeah. So it's like a tubal, or a, it can be in your fallopian tube or ovary. It's just like, I was joking, like, my old-ass ovaries with their, like, little walkers didn't, like, make it all the way down. <laughs> and um, then it's like a little... Yeah, then it can basically explode your ovary or fallopian tube when the baby, you know, they double every, like, freaking day. It's, like, crazy in those early weeks. And um, I went to the hospital on my birthday because I took a test that morning. I came back. I was having, like, a regular bleeding. So I went in, and they're like, oh, you're having um, a miscarriage or something like that. But they couldn't find it. And it, that was crazy too. That was like a wild. And I had just gotten back together with my now husband. I got married since the last time I saw you. Congratulations. Thank you. It's been a busy, it's been a busy year. And, um, that was just wild. And it was really sad and tragic, you know, we, cause they weren't sure. And then I had to get my blood drawn every two days to see if the levels were like going up or down. They're like, is this a failed, pregnancy or a chemical pregnancy which is where it doesn't really take but you still it'll still show up as pregnant and there was a minute where we thought maybe we were having a baby and then it, the levels doubled again and then they were like no and so they treat it with methotrexate which is chemo and they basically give you a shot in your butt and it stops the cells from dividing and it usually takes care of it if they catch it early enough. Now, you will catch this between, so I don't even know that you would need an abortion for it. You, they, you'll catch, Generally, you start exhibiting symptoms like between six and eight weeks. So it's like a plan B type deal, but it's in a shot. It's not plan B. I mean, it's, it's straight up it's chemo, chemo. It's but chemo. it's to stop the cells from dividing. Otherwise, you, like many people don't find out soon enough or they think it's like, I don't know what they think it is. It's, it stops the cells in your whole body from dividing? Well, it behaves like chemo, but because it's chemo, it stops the baby from continuing to divide mm. and in the past they would have to take out your fallopian tube or your ovary so it's really dangerous you can die and if you don't die in the past you would usually lose a, like a, at least a fallopian tube or an ovary so sometimes they can save the ovary they can't even do it it's not abortion they can't do it no abortion. no 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 it's okay. not it's not so even it like apply. you could have this baby at all Right. Um, it's really, truly, it's not good. So, Did they carve out, a, a, like, for the abortion law, like, what if it's a stillbirth? Like, what if the baby is inside of you and it's already dead? I don't know. I, I'm not sure what, like, any of the carve-outs. That six weeks is super early. It's, it's weird so because... It's so early that most women don't even know they're pregnant no, in six weeks. No, it was weird because when that happened, I was six weeks pregnant. And I was like, this is fucking early. Yeah. Like, the week that that came down, I was like, most people... Don't. The only reason I knew so early this time is because my husband was like, go get a fucking test. Like, your boobs are sensitive and, like, you're booking all this travel. I was supposed to go Schellenberger to Europe and go to South Africa and go to New York, and he's like, before you book all this, take a test, and I did, and it came back, but because I had a history of an ectopic pregnancy, they need to know right away, you have a higher instance of getting pregnant um, ectopically once you've already had an ectopic pregnancy. Mm. It goes up, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's like exponentially, so I had to find out right away if this was an ectopic, and it's just a crazy story because they had told me after my ectopic, we went and we were getting all my levels checked, and then COVID hit. So they're like, come back in six months and we'll retest you. Well, six months from November of 2019 was the world 
falling apart. So we lost kind of a year of like even thinking about fertility because everything was shut down. And I went back and they're like, oh, you're in menopause. Your levels are like full menopause. Um, they were like, we're shocked you're even getting a period. And this was after I got the J&J &J and I hadn't had a period in three months. <laughs> and this is an issue that is uh, apparently, according to my nurse, according to uh, a good doctor friend of mine, the, the, the hormone levels of people in certain circumstances that get vaccinated get all wacky. Right? Yeah, so to be fair, I don't know correlation or causation because they had done my levels right after my ectopic, but they were also very wacky. And they're like, this could be just because the ectopic and your hormones are all weird. So come back in six months and we'll test you again. And then it was COVID. So we didn't do that. I got the shot. I went back. And they're like, you're a menopause, you can't have kids. We need to get you. So it could have been from the ectopic. It could have been from the J&J. &J. Well, the, in 2019, when I got tested, it was definitely weird. And so then when I went back in 2021, recently, this was like in June when I went. And they're like, oh, you're in menopause. You can't have babies. And then I was very upset. And I, talk, I think you and I have talked about whether or not I wanted kids. And I mean, but I was kind of so... It's just a weird story. And so, that was only five months later, you're knocked up. That's what's crazy. What's crazy is a month later, I was knocked up. I got knocked up in July. <laughs> so, really? <laughs> yeah. And I so went to a fertility back. doctor, and they told me, you, this is going to cost you a lot of money. We want you to get these prenatals, but I'm telling you, it's going to be like the golden egg based on your levels. I got levels of of like my hormones and progesterone. They're, they were saying these are like menopause levels and we'd be shocked if we could even get like one viable egg. And so we I took I bought all these like prenatals from the fertility doctor and then I got them and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Like I'm 42. If I had wanted to do this. Like, it would have happened, and I'm not the kind of person that's going to force something like this. And I, my husband and I, were, we went back and visited my family. We were on the beach, and I'm like, are you cool if we're just not having kids, and, and maybe we can adopt later or whatever? And he's like, I'm fine. We'll save our money. We'll travel. And um, I, my, I was mad that I spent the money on the prenatals, and my therapist was like, well, just take them. They're good for your nails and hair and skin. And I'm like, all right. Oh, and I got knocked up. <laughs> so you took those pills, and I got fucking knocked up. So they worked. And then I was so like, "Wait a minute! The prenatals are designed to make you more fertile. They're correct? just you're supposed to take them before you. Um, they they do like an egg harvesting, but yes, you take like ubiquinol, which is good for cell development, and oh, you know, it's supposed to help like egg strength." And so egg maybe cell that strength. restarted your hormones. Who fucking knows? But I started taking them, and then I was pregnant. When we were having that conversation on the beach. I come back, go see my OB, who's no longer my OB, and I told her, "I'm like, I haven't had a period in 40 days because I got my period in between like the 90 days." And she was like, "That's just the menopause. We need to get you on birth control pills because you're going to lose bone density because you're a geriatric." <laughs> <laughs> And so wow. she gives me all these pills, doesn't test me for to be see if I'm pregnant. And, and that then, why you got rid of her? Well, yeah. And then a week later, I took the test and found out I was pregnant. And I was like, holy did shit. Did you call her up and go, hey, bitch? <laughs> yeah, I did. did I you? made her come. That Basically, she felt so bad because I was like, this is negligent. I had an ectopic pregnancy. Like, I could have lost a week of finding out because you think I'm just, you just assumed I'm an old which is a numbers game. I mean, it is amazing how they treat you when you're my age in pregnancy because it's geriatric at 35. Really? Yeah, they consider you geriatric at 35. You hear that, ladies? They don't really use that word anymore because it's fallen out of fashion, but they. I was joking with my OB. I'm like, I'm surprised you guys don't give me a fucking walker when I come in here. 35 is geriatric? That's but then the data doesn't lie. You know, the, the, the numbers for, like, downs, it's like when you look at all that stuff, it's like... It goes from one in 1,000 when you're in your early 30s to like one in 43 at my age. So Whoa. it's that stuff doesn't <laughs> lie. You know, that it's not, it's still a small chance, but it's still, there's a much higher probability of shit going wrong right. when you're 
an old like me. You're an old? An you old. call yourself an old? I'm an old. <laughs> and that's what we were laughing about. It's so crazy. So the first like trimester, I was I'm and I'm still very cautiously optimistic. It's I want all the good vibes from your whole audience. Um it's such a miracle and crazy and we were very like, uh, okay, like I went in for that first ultrasound to find out that it was an ectopic because they have to look right away and she's like no it's intrauterine it's like a little sack it's not viable i'm like how do i make it stick <laughs> she's like honey if i knew that i'd be a billionaire on a private <laughs> island i'm like yeah i suppose so that's true before you got vaccinated you were having regular periods yeah like every freaking 23 days i mean and then right after you got vaccinated not a period for 90 days and here's the thing when i went in to talk to my ob and when I would go for my checkups, all the nurses, not the doctors, the I'd be like, you know, I got my vaccine. They're like, oh, everyone's period's messed up from the vaccine. I'm like, everyone? Don't, shouldn't we be talking about this? And what's crazy is that they just started studying how COVID affects women who are pregnant. Like, they didn't think to fucking do this when people were getting COVID and women were getting COVID and they were pregnant. So they really had no idea how it was the vaccine was going to affect a woman's menstruation, women who are pregnant, et cetera. And then you hear all these like stories online and the, a lot of it. The problem is that so much of it is suppressed and you're just not, people don't know what to believe. It is a problem. It's a problem because even we don't know what the real numbers are. Right. So if someone says the numbers are incredibly small. Good. Tell us what the numbers are so that we can show that the numbers are incredibly small. Or that like, yeah, yeah. your period's going to be messed up, but it's going to bounce back. But I'm hearing stories of people who are like bleeding and they don't stop. And yes, it's all anecdotal. But at what point is is like a lot of anecdotal evidence <laughs> data? Actually, evidence, you know? yeah. <laughs> well, it's like we were talking about about, you know, the chances of a child being Down syndrome. Like we know this because of data. Right. They're not suppressing that. They're not like encouraging women who are older to get knocked up and and lying about the data. Yeah. I mean, they're very my my OB is very conservative. They should tell you what the data is on everything. So we should be accumulating the data on everything. What you're not hearing. And this is not saying that people shouldn't get vaccinated. This is not saying the vaccine's bad. What I'm saying is you're not hearing what the adverse reactions are. You're not hearing them. They're well, not for, reporting on them. They're not making a big deal out of it. They're not following up and like having And these, it makes people more skeptical. Yes. They're not having these hard discussions about like who is it? Why are they getting these adverse reactions? What's the pattern? And if you're not following that, if they're just hiding it, like if if the VAERS report like what percent because I was reading this thing that was claiming that the VAERS reports, which is the vaccine adverse event reporting system, that they only report 1% of the actual adverse events. I'm like, how do you know that? How right. does anyone know that? Like, I don't know what the actual reporting numbers are, but I do know people that I'm close to that have had horrible reactions, They those reactions did not get reported. Right. So what what percentage of actual adverse events do get reported. It bothers me because for all the talk in our culture about informed consent, you know, just what it's like you you should be able to make an informed decision about this for yourself. But they're deciding for you. I have a friend who's also pregnant and she does not want to get the vaccine because she doesn't want to mess with it. And I don't frankly don't blame her. And women have had to fight so hard. Women! For, for just advocating for themselves and their health. And I don't want to get this shot while I'm going through labor. I, it's so It's been such a huge fight. And to try and act like you can now force this on any woman, anyone, anyone. Let's just stop there. But particularly a woman who's pregnant who yeah. might be skeptical when there's... There's a lot of unknowns, and I'm sorry. I know the MRA has been mRNA has been around for 20 years, and like I've heard every fucking been, article, every it has argument. Been mass inoculated, and on top of that, there's not long-term data. There's there just, just not. isn't. There just yeah, isn't. there isn't. And for, I, I for, don't especially blame for pregnant women. I there there's something about so the mandates came down for kids for California, and they did a poll in California, and only a third of people want to vaccinate their kids. I mean, this is not a popular I'm mandate. It's that high. I'm shocked it's that high because when you find out what, what's actually dangerous, 
like what whether or not COVID is actually dangerous for children. It's not. No. It's not. No. And kids still it, relatively get sick. Speaking. And then I'm seeing what all my friends who have kids are going through because of all these insane, crazy, like quarantine policies that these schools have that are nonsensical. So one kid will get exposed in a class and then like only the three kids around that kid had to quarantine for two days. And even if they had a negative test, they still had to stay out for two weeks. Okay, but here's why that's not crazy. The reason why that's not crazy is because if those kids go home and give it to their parents or give it to their grandma, and then the grandma gets sick, and then the grandma dies, or they give it to the teacher, but and the teacher only... gives it to the spouse, and the spouse dies. Why not? Quar- I mean, it's weird, though, like only those four kids in the room of kids are the ones who are exposed you know what do you mean like of this entire classroom if one kid's exposed and comes back as like positive right then only like four kids are going to be quarantined not like the whole class oh i see what you're saying what what is the science i want to know what science that is so it's basically what they're saying is the kids that are closest to that kid yeah they got quarantined. Well, the dumb thing about it is, like, you're not following that kid around with a ruler. <laughs> That's like, what I uh, mean. Billy, and you're closer whole... than six feet. <laughs> but didn't they come out and say, like, the six feet thing was kind of bullshit? bullshit? So total bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> I laugh at every time I see it in line. I'm yeah. like, someone the other day on Twitter was like, I wonder how many peop- lives have been saved by those, like, s- the things in the elevators. Have you seen this meme? I'm gonna sh- I'll send it to Jamie because it's one of my favorite new memes. Hold so, on, yeah, please. it's it's a definite... Um. Yeah, it's a fuck. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, it's if a, I like you were saying, I was I was joking because my first um trimester, all I wanted was like plant based food. I was and I love meat. I was I couldn't eat every time I ate red meat, I'd puke. And I was like, my baby's a fucking globalist. This is from the vaccine. <laughs> this. This one. Oh yeah, I love that. Tell me more about how a virus can escape from a level four bio lab, but can't get past a mask with little duckies on it. I this love is, it. It's Gene Wilder from uh, Willy Wonka. With a big smile <laughs> so on his good. face. It's such a great meme. I know. I love it. And I, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. How the fuck? So I was joking about how my baby was a globalist because I was like, this is from the vaccine. I'm not a vegan. This is, and I, I was like, why is my child craving food? Like all the plant-based, the way they're all like pushing it and like, you know, great reset. <laughs> I'm like, I was like, I'm going to be craving bugs soon. And then like two months in, I started craving Taco Bell, which I haven't had in a decade. And I was like, oh, my vaccine must be wearing off. <laughs> And it is wearing off. It's wearing off. We got off. your antibodies test today. They're like ghosts. I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> your antibodies are like, woo. Like ghosts. Are enough. I mean, there's so many jokes to be made about it, obviously. Yeah. But it is, I do appreciate that you're still willing to have these conversations. Because well, I'm not stopping now. Now they've you already come after me. They could eat shit. <laughs> No, like they're I'm not. Have, they're not talking about these things, and it's a real problem because they're they want to push a narrative so badly that they don't understand that they're censoring dissenting thought and they're censoring information that's counter to the narrative, whether it's accurate or not. And a lot of it turns out to be accurate, like the lab leak theory, right? Like the fact that the NIH and Fauci did fund gain of function research, right. and like the fact that he lied about it. And those it, are conspiracy theories just a little while ago. So was a vaxport. So was yes. a mandate. Yes, and the way that they do these mandates where it is the public kind of coercing the private so it's not like the government's just straight up saying we're going to mandate it they're they're using the private sector to try and do their dirty work yes and i don't appreciate that and well, I, that's what i loved about in and out stepping up yeah yeah they're like we're not the vaccine police no we, the, pe- people should be able to make their own informed choices about their bodies <laughs> and it's just discriminate i mean this is the whole piece i just wrote about lectures from limousine li- liberals where i was just raging because so many of the being in california in particular this is probably true in, more in blue states that were more locked down there was there were so many of these mandates that hurt the people that we like ostensibly care about like the When you shut down the outdoor parks, that didn't hurt rich people with big backyards. That hurt people who lived in, you know, apartments and they didn't have access to these public spaces. When you like Gavin Newsom's kids going to private school while his frickin gardeners probably their kids probably weren't allowed to go to school like the 
there was such a disproportionate, it, it affected the poor the most. And that was infuriating for me to see. And then, and to have all these like frontline workers who worked through the whole pandemic delivering food. My husband worked in a grocery store at the time. They were all around it the whole time. And now you're going to yell at them and tell them that they need to get a vaccine? Like well, the nurses? Even, yeah, the nurses are the most disgusting story. That's disgusting. Yeah, it's disgusting. And the police, they were people were spitting on police officers in protests during a fucking pandemic. Like, where was your problem with spreading the virus then when you were screaming in it's their face? It's not even just that. It's not even just that. It's the fact that these guys actually had COVID. And they recovered. Mm-hmm. So they have the antibodies. So it's this is completely unscientific because they actually have better immunity than people who have just gotten vaccinated. And there's been a lot of propaganda about this from the other side. They're trying to like say, no, it's not true. I saw some fucking thing the other day on uh, one, of, one of the health websites, um, one of the government websites. I'm fucking which, I don't, god damn it, I could find it. But it was... A fucking lie. It's just not supported by data. The data from Israel, which is the best data that we have, 2.5 million people, I believe, they studied, found that the da- the immunity that you get from a national infection, from having COVID and recovered, is 6 to 13 times better. Not a little better. Not equal to. 6 to 13 times better. So people like our nurse that was here, yeah, she had to work through the early days of COVID yeah. with no mask. Yeah. The, the doctors and the, the administrators told her when she wears a mask, it scares people. Oh, so God. don't wear a mask. So she got COVID. Everyone she works with also got COVID. They recovered. And then they're being asked to get vaccinated on top of that. Yeah, I, I mean, that stuff, it, it's, it's like crazy. what makes my blood boil. It's crazy. And then they fire them. So in the middle of a pandemic, when you're firing... A, a large percentage of your healthcare workers. And when you're following, firing a large percentage of your fire department, yep. your your police officers. Yeah, you have people in like very niche, like the uh, rescue jumpers, the guys who jump out of helicopters and yeah. in the Coast Guard. They're, they're saying there's a big piece, like 20% of them are might not. This is not something everyone can do. And but these guys are peak are backing health. Down. Some companies are back. Like Delta's backing down off of it. I think I saw that Southwest was too. They should. They I, should. I because mean, again, the, the, if you're not taking into account natural immunity, and you know, you can't even search natural immunity on Instagram. That's what I don't understand. Why? That I mean, I, I on my like conspiratorial, like, it's because they want to make money, but it seems like even in in Italy, I think the green the green pass accepts natural immunity for within six months or something. It seems like they accept it other places. I don't understand why we aren't even testing for it. Because they want you to get vaccinated. <laughs> it's really Isn't simple. That simple? Like, it's that is simple? Like, is it? But that it is seems that simple. like it just. They want, they want you to get vaccinated. That just brings me right back to my hippie days, like, fuck Big Pharma. They just want us Listen, all medicated. The idea they that don't all want of a sudden, us healthy. during a pandemic, that this is the only time where the pharmaceutical companies don't have influence over po- politicians and that they do have your health in mind only and they're not interested in making a shitload of money, that they're only interested and actually taking care of people and making sure this pandemic is over and that they are completely altruistic and that they they're not thinking at all about money that is fucking crazy talk <laughs> the incentives are just so bad too like i was thinking about this in mental health and you know people so from the insurance perspective you can't get treated unless you have a diagnosis so you have to have some kind of disorder or be diagnosed with something in order to have your insurance even pay for it. And so we're just handing out, instead of being like, oh, maybe you're just anxious because like life can be anxiety provoking. You've got to be diagnosed with like generalized anxiety disorder or whatever in order to even get treatment for it. And then we're so quick to just medicate the symptom instead of really looking at a lot of the root causes. You've been like a dog with a bone on this in terms of talking about how there's been no conversation about a lot of the underlying things people can do to boost their health so they don't get COVID or recover quickly from COVID. 
I mean, yeah, everybody nothing. gained weight during the pandemic. Have you seen the numbers for kids? Kids got fat. Kids got super fat. I'm sure Jamie could find it. My buddy told me that his son got fat and that uh, his son got shamed by his buddies when they went back to school. They were like, oh, you got fat because he, he gained 40 pounds. No, the, the average. He, but, he, but that shame forced him to stop <laughs> eating carbs and stop eating sugar and he lost the weight. Oh, good. Yeah. In, in something like six, six or seven weeks, he lost all the weight. I mean, everybody, I think they were doing all the numbers, and I don't know if these are the accurate things, but it was like the average millennial, it, it varied by generation. I think Gen X was like 25, millennials were like 40 pounds, gain, average gained 40 pounds. Four zero? Yeah, and Gen Z gained a lot, and I mean, boomers real? actually did okay. I, I'll look harder, but the one I'm on only says like five to two pounds gained. For who? Compared sense. to the year before. For, these are for younger, uh, 5 to 11 and 16 to 17 year olds. Oh, those are young youngins. Yeah, but but what about thing, millennials? Hold on, hold on. Kids are growing. They gain weight anyway. Like, uh, like, let me tell you something. Kids, you give them six months, they gain five pounds just because they got bigger. Yeah. I thought kids got fat, though. They mm -hmm. weren't running around. I read, Some I read something. I could be totally wrong. Maybe my, I'm wrong. My buddy's son got fat. He was just <laughs> talking about it. But it was funny. He always saying, fat shaming worked. Like he got fat and like he's like, Dad, what do I do? He's like, Well, you got to stop eating carbs and stop eating so much bread and some pasta and, get some and sugar. And, yeah, the weird so thing it. is the reverse fat shaming, where like they 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 shame Adele for losing weight. <laughs> well, this so the second article I've stumbled across kind of says that fat kids got fatter, so like obese kids gain more weight and they're wow. more, they were more on a bad path. Kids, so yeah, that's it's so yeah. hard when you're young to lose that weight. The Adele thing is wild. No, the Adele thing's wild. It's so sad because these people who are just sloppy and they don't <laughs> like the fact that she got her shit together and changed her diet and really started getting after it and works she, out like a beast. And she did it because, like she said, I did this because when I was working out, I found that I didn't feel anxiety. And I always tell my friends who are anxious, I'm like, move your fucking body. You know, yeah. when you're feeling that, get that. And sometimes it's just... Energy, energy that needs to go somewhere yeah, like you're and, an overflowing battery yeah and so she started working out and noticed and she's like it had nothing to do with me losing weight i just felt better and i felt like that was the only time i didn't have anxiety so then she just started increasing it and then she started feeling less anxious and feeling better and low and it was like three years and they were mad that she didn't like didn't share her the level of entitlement that people have over somebody like that to their internal life and process and that's just so wild to me like they were mad that she didn't share her journey and well, wasn't open about it it's worse than that because what it really is is that they love the fact that she was also sloppy and that like they identified with her here's this woman who's incredibly talented she's got this amazing voice and she's sloppy like me <laughs> i love it you go. Big girls are beautiful. Like all that crazy talk. I know? mean, I, I don't want to say big girls aren't beautiful. I think Listen, I think how everyone... are fat guys? How are fat guys doing? They're hot. They're not doing. They're beautiful. Well. Fat guys are hot, right? They're... Yeah, they're just as hot. <laughs> this is crazy talk. No, they're I'm just not... as beautiful. If you don't think Adele looks way better now, you're full she of shit. She looks amazing. She no. looks way better. Yeah. Right. I think that. Doesn't she look way better? <laughs> Say it. No, she looks- Women! Women! <laughs> I don't want- Say it. Here's the problem. I'm trying to be a nice you person. You not to say it. She looks better. She uh, she looks amazing. Better? She... <laughs> yeah, I mean- You she... don't want to say it. Be she looks better. Obviously. Yeah, sloppy's not good, But right? I don't think she looked- Like, sh I still thought she was beautiful, she was beautiful when she before. was- overweight well she has amazing facial structure so clearly. that's what i don't that I, I don't want like we were talking about earlier shame is a hard thing to get over and i know a lot of people who struggle with their weight and i don't want them to feel like they're any less beautiful because they m are struggling with their weight and you are such a woman that's such a woman perspective because there's not a man alive that goes these guys out here that are fat i don't want them feeling bad with their big bellies. I want them to know they're fucking handsome as shit. But I know what women who have this struggle go through. I've talked to hundreds of them. And I know how hard... I know... I understand... I've had to be schooled because I am absolutely, like, fat phobic. And I'm not afraid of fat people. 
I'm afraid of the fat person inside of me. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you this. The fat person that wants to get out into the world. That's yes. what I'm afraid of. What is the difference with men and women with fat? Because you, you said mean? you keep saying women. I know how women feel. Well, men women feel the feel... same way. I think men have a I think men are just not as open about it. I, I know a lot of men have struggled with their fat their feelings about being fat and and But why is it okay? And why is I think it's easier in the male culture to be like, get your shit together, fat ass, and get out there and work out and stop eating so many donuts. Right. But why is it also like no one supports fat men? No one is saying to fat men, you're beautiful the way you are. <laughs> Doesn't happen. Do they have the same... When Burt Kreischer takes his shirt off... No He's one, a hero. No one is looking at him and going, you're a beautiful person. They That's love amazing. it when he takes they his love shirt off. That's like slob. his whole fucking thing. It's, but it's, it, it is a mockery. But I read like, dude, I wrote a doing whole it because piece he about how dad bod is like acceptable and with women it's not acceptable hold on please did you see Burt Kreischer's Instagram go to Burt Kreischer's Instagram and see this video that he posted yesterday of him shirt off in Tampa and he is you know that's where he's from or Tallahassee rather is he from Tallahassee well, he's, from, he's from Tampa he went to Florida State okay so, same, w same. W where's Florida State Tallahassee okay I think that's where he's at so he is uh, on stage. It's a massive crowd. Bert is doing motherfucking arenas now. They love so, his but belly. The, but you don't understand. No, you said, see the video. There's a video. This is fucking. Cr it's, no, that's not the video. Go back, please. Go back. Go, let me see it. I'll send it to you because he sent it to me. Hold on a second. I'm, I'm confused here because I don't see it up there. They love it. They love it. But there was a video that is just him on stage. Yeah. Oh, it's in his stories. That's okay. why. Or his reels. Here. Share. Share to Jamie. This is wild. I mean, this is wild. Here, I, I just sent it to you, Jamie. You got to see this. This is fucking wild. He's on stage. First of all, I think he's culturally oh, appropriating. What's that? It's on somebody else's page. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. So look at this. Give me some volume. Oh, boy. <laughs> You're like, I Why think is this uh, the wrong aspect ratio? It looks different on my phone where I see the whole crowd. You only see, like, part of it. It's weird. <laughs> You're like, I think he's Instagram? culturally appro yeah. appropriating. The, the browser and phone are different. <laughs> <laughs> the Vikings. Web browser in the phone is a different image. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, but look, play that again. They love him. How are you telling me that it's not different from men? Well, first of all, he's got the feathers in the, the, the arrow. That's what I'm saying. I think he might be culturally appropriate. Yeah, he, he definitely is. Is it? <laughs> I mean, We're doing I a think war so. chant too. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Braves thing that they do. Look at all those people with their phones out with the lights on. I mean, that it, it's hard to see when we're looking at it through this browser versus through my phone. But when you, when you look at it through the phone, you get the full image of like how fucking big his crowd is. Like, look at that. Oh, wow, yeah. It's huge. It's fucking insane. And it, plus it cuts to the left and to the right, so you really get a, a view of it. So is your Bert did is, a, fuck, a fucking arena. He, you're, so you're not making the point that men <laughs> are treated... So he No one's saying he looks beautiful. It's, they say it's, all the it's time. It's a joke. <laughs> no, his fat is a joke. Do you, you know that? Like that's why he you, takes his shirt off because it's funnier. Right. No one's saying, you know, you're hot. No one's saying that. When he takes his gut out, it's like, ah, look at you, fat fuck. It's part of the fun. Right. Part of the fun is that he doesn't take care of himself and that he drinks constantly <laughs> and he's fat. Right? Well, I mean, He's yeah. celebrated for his comedy. Sorry. Well, that was a way better <laughs> video of the, what oh, you're trying to get. He, he, let me see it. Look at that. Come on. That is wow. fucking insane. Burt Kreischer, you bad motherfucker, you. He's got these people chanting some fucking war trucks. <laughs> Burt Kreischer's going to be president of the United States. <laughs> At least I'm calling it right now. A drunk president. They love him. War cry. Look at that war cry. They love Everyone's him. with him. Yeah! 
Oh, I don't know what that is, but pretty wild. My point is, yes. No one's saying you're beautiful. <laughs> Everyone's saying, "Look at you, fat fuck." They love him. He's hilarious. Yes. But that gut is not for beauty. Fat people still deserve love, Joe. I think they do. <laughs> I think they do. But my my point was that your reluctance to say that Adele looks better. Um, she looks better. She oh no, she looks better. She looks Thank amazing. You. That's all I'm trying to get out. I of mean, here. she, she looks incredible. Weight. Anyone could do it. Yeah. They can. Just like you got sober. Yeah. People can accomplish difficult things, and it's worth it. This is the weird, um, like dichotomy or paradox that I kind of sit in, and, and I I often feel this way about people when they're like, "But they're drug addicts, and they're like on the streets." And I'm like, "Oh, that could have been me." You know. <laughs> and what was you, right? I mean, not on the streets, but it, you were. I live. Yeah, I mean, when I got a rehab, I was in my car. I wasn't doing great, and definitely there. But what's that? I do love the. You know, I tried. I I try very hard to have compassion. I don't want to be just like a hardcore. You know, I think pe- like you and I have said, people need support, um, and there, but for the grace of God, go I. In many instances, but and I and I do think a weird because I agree a certain level of shaming works. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. It's real. It was like how I. I mean, that's why this piece of like how I. I regret being a slut is hard to write because I don't want to slut shame myself, but I was deaf. I mean, it came about because this young woman I was waiting tables with, she's like, Bridget, have you ever regret sleeping with a man? I was like, all of them. (laughs) But, and that's not necessarily true, but I don't know that I would have slept with a good majority of them had I not been like wasted and just. Right. But your writing is all about, honesty and about your honest feelings of thing but this is one area where you don't like to discuss it or you feel bad about no, it it's a hard needle to thread you know mm. I, I think that it's hard to thread without if i was to be totally honest i think it's that i felt like i had been lied to by the culture like the culture was giving me this message and gives a lot. I mean, this is a message that I see a lot of young women get, but they're getting it in even this weirder, weirder version than the one that I grew up with, which was like, I don't think you need to have kids to be like, you what was know, what you got, which one was you? What was your version? It you was got? really just like that female empowerment through sex. We, like sex in the city. Yeah. Yeah. That was what I grew up with. Was like, who was the lady that fucked everybody on Sex and the Samantha, City? Samantha, I think. I never yeah. watched it because I hated it because I'm not, I hate, hate that show. Which Why? I don't know. My, I cannot watch it. I'm not a, like, consumer at all on, like, a brand tour. I don't know anything. So whenever they talked about shoes, and I was like, I, I'm out. I can't, <laughs> I can't have this conversation. I don't care. And, um... It was weird. It wasn't also just a life that I identified with, but I understand everyone around me loved it and it was constantly being referenced. And when I started writing a Playboy, they're like, oh my God, you're like a female Carrie or whatever her name was. (laughs) Um, And like a female Carrie? Well, as opposed to what? I don't know. Fuck are you trying to say? Or like in LA. Are you gender shaming her? (laughs) That was a Freudian slip. Whoops. It's really why I couldn't watch that show. Um, Mm. No, so I grew up with a lot of that. And now I see, I read this great article about like baby doomers. This is like the new thing where it's like, don't have kids because of the environment. Have you seen this? No. It's so unfair to, you know, I don't, and I I do, I was just talking to my friend right before I came here and she was so excited for me. And we used to party together. And she was talking about how she, the same thing, like the messages she got growing up were so much like, you can, you don't need to have a baby. And it's just like, there's all this pressure to have a kid. And, and she was like having a kid, she said she found so much meaning. And, and she's like, I wish I had known this sooner because so much of the stuff I was searching for, I've found so much healing in having a child. In motherhood. In motherhood. Yeah. And she was, she and I were having this conversation. I'm like, it's, you know, I've been the woman who didn't have a kid and I've heard a lot of, it it comes a lot from like hardcore kind of reactionary right wing media, particularly where it's like, you're not valuable as a woman unless you have a child. And I am very 
oppositionally defiant <laughs> to that mm -hmm. rhetoric because I know a lot of women who have tried to have children and couldn't, and I don't think it's fair to put that messaging out there. Yeah, I don't think it is either. It's also not real. It's not real. You can, you can have a wonderful life You can have children. meaning all kinds of yeah. ways without children, but I do think that in the overcorrection from those like 1950s years, there was this push to almost deter women from having kids and 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 saying that they can there is this pressure to kind of have it all and now it's like don't have kids because the world is ending which is insane to me because like people yes they didn't have a choice but people were having kids during like the black plague you know mm -hmm. like shit's been way worse for humans through all of human history in terms of medicine, conditions, poverty, and and even just childbirth and surviving it than now. And people are like, don't have kids. They're scaring people out of having children. I'm reading these real articles about people who are... And I will tell any women listening, like what I really struggled with around my 40th birthday was that I had internalized so much of this and I, I lied to myself. Like, I lied to myself for many, many years that I didn't want to have kids. I didn't, I was good. I I didn't need to have kids. Mostly that I didn't want them. And it, when I hit 40 and that window started closing and I met a man, I also was, I didn't, I didn't want to have a kid just for the sake of having a kid. But then once I met a man, I wanted a family. And once I was with this person, I I felt like, you know, people told me to freeze my eggs. I didn't. Um, and I really had to confront that lie that I told myself because once the option was more off the table um, and wasn't even a possibility or so I thought, um, I really was faced with how much of a how much deception had gone into upholding this idea of being like this single woman who didn't need to have kids. It was like bullshit that I was telling myself. So you think it was like a defense mechanism because yeah. it wasn't really available for you? Yeah, because I wasn't in a good relationship. And yeah, yeah it was absolutely a defense mechanism. Because also because I didn't feel worthwhile because I was slut shaming myself. That's why I say it's a hard needle to thread because so much of the shame around my sexuality, not feeling like I deserved it, not feeling like. I deserve to have a kid. Even when I first got with this pregnancy, I'm still very like there. I had to overcome these. I'm like, why do I feel like I don't deserve this? Like, that's just crazy. Like you say, it's crazy. But it is those those things um, are I've internalized so much not positive um, feelings and ideas about motherhood or having a child and I'm not sure where because I I mean my mom had five kids and loved being a mom. So it certainly wasn't coming from like my my all my siblings have kids. Well, it's probably part of living a reckless and independent life. And, and being that, in a city. I was yeah. the only one of my siblings who was like in a city. And just also being when I was really grinding in comedy, I just was like, there you these two things aren't really compatible unless you have a lot of help and money and you're right. successful. And um, I felt like I had to make a choice and in some respects I did, but it, you know, I don't think that, I don't know that I made that choice. That choice is really made for me. The choices are weird, right? Because they're sort of biologically dependent, meaning that you, you have a, a window of time, right? It's not like women in particular. Else. Yeah. It's not like anything else in life Yeah, where you really only have if you're a woman, you got like 20-something years. Oh, hell hath no fury. Lucky. Like, I have a... There is a special place in hell for men who waste a woman's, like, fertility years and don't... And know that they don't want kids or that they're not ready to marry them or whatever. And they're in their, you know, early 30s, mid-30s. And they're just... Like, that is not okay. Wait a minute, though. 
Don't you think that your deception that you lied to yourself when you were telling yourself that you were happy being a single woman? Yeah, but I woman, think that's different than but being. But you think that a man? Do you, do you think that a man is more responsible? That he should have more of an understanding of what a woman feels? But I like? think there are instances where men know that a woman wants a child. I'm speaking of relationships where the man knows she wants being a child very and. Specific? Inevitably, no, I just hear this a lot from mm-hmm. women where they're in these relationships and the guy is kind of like, well, I don't know if I want to get married. And then they end up breaking up and it's like there's years that they right, could have been out there. Yeah, but it might not also just been that. It might also been the relationship sucked. It might also been they were trying to make no, sure that this was the right person that they wanted to have a kid with. Because some relationships go fucking sideways. No, I agree. And if you have a kid with a girl and then you're connected to her forever... And it goes sideways. And now she's fucking crazy and she wants money from you all the time and she's shaming <laughs> you and angry at you. Like men are scared of that kind of commitment because it's a commitment that attaches you to someone mm-hmm. for the rest of your life. And if you get lucky and you find a good person, it's great. Right. But if you don't get lucky. But I think if they're scared of it, then they shouldn't waste their time. They don't know. They don't know how the relationship's going to go. Like all relationships when you don't know if it's going to work out well. Yeah. How do you know? But how do you not know after like five years, for example? Sometimes it gets better. Sometimes it gets worse. I don't know. I I think I put it on the woman too to like get out if they're if they really want to have that kid and they're not sure. But I do think that people need to like you said, there's a there is a timer on that shit. Yeah. But there's also like it's a give and take. There's two people involved in this shit. And if the guy like bails out and he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. And like, you wasted my time. No, but fucking we wasted both of our times. Yeah. It didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Relationships are so fucking They're complicated. They're so because fucking you're hard. you're different. You are different with a different person. Yeah. We all are. If you were with the wrong husband or the wrong wife, you are a different fucking person yeah. than you are with the right person. You know, like, how many times have you met a girl and she's, like, single and single? I'm never going to get married. Fuck that. And then she meets the right guy. Boom, she's married. Next thing you know, she has kids. Like, what happened? I met the right guy. I changed my mind. I mean, that was me. Yes. It happens with guys. It happens with women. Yeah. Like, you think you're, you know, you don't know. No. And also, like, how many people are, like, if you're looking for six like if you're looking for six characteristics and they have four yeah and you're like well he's gonna get his shit together and get a job eventually well he's gonna do this but he never does like i i've know people that are involved in relationships and they're not totally happy but they're not totally unhappy right that's what's fucked that's the worst though i think yes i think it's much easier when it's like dysfunctional but you have great sex right. or whatever you know like <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, or yeah. when it's like it, it's an easy clear decision yeah. i think it's much harder when someone is checks a lot of boxes on paper but yeah. maybe like the passion isn't there right this is what i hear about a lot because i still get tons of emails about this stuff from people from working for playboy and i love them because i think like the human relationships are fascinating and particularly this kind of stuff where uh, a man will be a man and a woman will be in a relationship and the sex life and intimacy just goes away. But, you know, they have kids and a house and they have all of these things and and there's there's still this thing that's missing or people are together and they're like, well, it's good enough. And you're like, is it though? Right. Like, I, I mean, the sex thing for me, that needs to be, that needs to be, <laughs> that needs yeah. to be a functioning part of the relationship. It does. And, you know, the sex thing is, generally speaking, better if your body works better. Right. And so that requires you to take care of yourself. And that requires you to have discipline and to watch your diet. And you know, That was one of the promises my husband and I, we, we met in recovery. And so we had those shared values just from meeting in recovery. But we, when we got together, we, one of the promises was, like, we won't let ourselves go. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like we can't, you know Sad. that you because you see it happen and it does. It I know that for me, I don't feel as sexy when I'm a little chubby. You know, I, I'm just not when I, I'm not working out or I'm not taking care of myself. I don't feel like, uh, like. How do you think Bert feels? <laughs> he looks like he's killing it. <laughs> Probably getting laid every night. He's famous. <sighs> 
yeah. don't know though. I'd have to be like plumber no, Bert. Would, I'm listen, not sure. <laughs> Bert sent me a picture of him when he was like uh, 20, 21 years old, and Slim Bert was a handsome bastard. He Bert, Bert in his college years was fucking shredded. Yeah. I mean, he looked good. <laughs> well, I don't want to say shredded, but he was fit. That's fit Bert. Look Whoa. at that. Come on. Okay, he looks better. He looks way better. <laughs> Look how good he looks. Holy Look, shit. Fit, slim Bert. I mean, he looks yeah, good. Yeah, he looks hot. And I bet if you did his uh, like blood panel, it'd be like healthier. Now, Bert now is just like. Wow. Bert now is killing it, but, you know, there's a difference. That's actually, he was thinner then <laughs> when he was doing the dance thing. What that, Doesn't he do the like sober October with you when you guys do you that? I want to do it this year. Are we you did, doing we it? We didn't do it this year. No. Oh. No. <laughs> and you're never going to do it no. again. <laughs> I'll do it again. I don't mind doing it. Um, but, you know, one of the things was like, I was doing Mass in Square Garden. I'm like, listen, I'm having a drink. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to smoke nervous? a little weed. I was excited. Yeah. I, was ex- I get nervous for all shows, though. I get nervous when I do 200 people. I get. Ju- I was. T- I was telling this to my uh, my friend Phil last night. I was like, I get just as nervous when I do sixteen thousand people as when I do two hundred people. Yeah, it's the same feeling. The exact I get same nervous. Feeling. I get nervous before I even like coming to talking to you. I'll be like nervous. It's for me. It's like the even like going to like the ultrasound. I was like, I really get the worst anticipatory anxiety, and I know that it's my brain. I'm like, you're excited. You're you're excited and nervous, but right, but you're not performing at the ultrasound. No, no, place. no. But it's like the same um, that same feeling of of uh, anticipation when I'm in, and same thing as before when I would like be about to go on stage. I could barely talk to people because I'd be nervous and talking to people would help. But once I get talking, it's fine. There's a big difference for me. The difference in anticipation of performing versus the difference of anticipation of anything else. Like any anxiety that I have for other things is so much more manageable. Manageable? Yeah. Well, it's all manageable, obviously, because yeah. I manage it. But the, the it's a different feeling. Like when I'm about to go on stage, I'm jumping around, I'm doing breathing exercises, yeah. I'm getting my mind geared up. That was like me before my ultrasound. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not performing. You no, know what I'm saying? I know like I'm not, not You don't have to do specific still things like I'm correctly. worried about the baby, you know? Right. I know what you're like, saying. It's yeah. it, I, I get I I definitely get before I do anything kind of performative, I absolutely get that. Um, I I have to like move around. Yeah, this is part of the rush of doing difficult things is that you're not sure if you can do them. Have you watched Dune? No. Okay. I heard two it. things. Like Tim Pool said it sucked. I loved it, but I'm such a sucker for Tim, stuff like that. I don't know if Tim's correct, but he said it sucked. He but, said he fell asleep. Yeah. He did. But then Tim Kennedy. I love it. My two it. Tims. Did you watch it, Jamie? Of, let's call it a Tale of Two Tims. Because Tim Kennedy <laughs> said that um, like he could watch Doom all day or Doom. Dune all day Fear long is a forever. Killer. That's one of the quotes in the book. Oh, don't be a spoiler alert. It's person. a quote in the book. I'm supposed to read the book. It's everywhere. So I know. You're gonna say, now that person <laughs> says, I'm like, Bridget already told me this. <laughs> no, it's so you should watch it. But I would I'm watch it on watch a big it screen. You ruined it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Fear is a mind killer. Uh, it is a mind killer, though. Yeah. That's accurate. You're right. Fear fucks your fucking head up. But it also, like, you know, that's it's shocking old me that you get nervous. Quote. Why is it shocking? Um, because you don't seem like you get nervous. We'll define nervous. I'm not worried. Not worried. Like, I know I can do it. Yeah. But I get nervous. Yeah. I get nervous for everything. I, you know, when I used to fight, the times that I wasn't nervous, I fought like shit. Yeah. There's that somebody once told me with stuff that isn't fight or flight, much like stand up or f- performance anxiety, um, the brain it's it's the same, um, it is the same like registers the same as excitement. It's just how you're interpreting it. So I always have to be before I get on stage. I'm like I'm not scared. I'm excited. <laughs> Mm. I'm not scared. I'm excited. I'm just excited right. and I'm interpreting it as being afraid. Well, the danger is if you go on stage and you concentrate on the potential for failure, that's the same as the danger in fighting. Mm-hmm. Like, you, it, fighters have to know what they're doing is very dangerous, but you can't concentrate on the negative only. You have to think about what you're trying to do. It's basically like the secret. It's no, you know what it reminds me of, though? What? Tony Robbins who I actually fucking love, he did this great 
talk one time about how he was learning how to race car drive. And the teacher, because why not when you're Tony Robbins, and the teacher was telling him not to, you know, it's like that idea of like, don't focus on what you might crash into, focus on coming out of, focus on where you're going. Right. Like, look towards where you're going. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Don't focus on the, but that kind of is like the secret. (laughs) It kind of is. But it's it, the law of attraction. You're I mean, do you have it, mantras or anything like no. that? No, but it's not because you're also putting in the work. Like yeah. what I said before, like the, one of the reasons why I'm excited and nervous is because I care. And the reason why I'm not terrified is because I've known I've done the work. I've done so many shows I'm, and I'm in, I'm in what you would call comedy shape, right? I'm working tomorrow night. I'm working yeah. Wednesday night. I'm working Thursday night. I'm working Friday night. I'm fucking, and I worked last night. So I'm working yeah. all the time. I'm doing sets all the time. So I'm doing multiple hours a week and I'm going over my notes and I'm writing and I'm preparing. And then when I go on stage, when I'm about to go on stage, I get ramped up. Yeah. But it's because I care. And also because I've eaten shit before and it sucks. Like you can't, and also like people pay to see you. Yeah. You, you yeah. can't, you can't, you can't half-ass it. I've had to rely on... It's interesting, though, because like you were saying, some of the stuff that I tell myself is not healthy, obviously. So how do you undo that? My therapist is a big fan of... Not like the secret, but she's a big fan of um, mantras, which I've never been a huge fan of. Although I I will admit, reluctantly, that in this early first trimester, because I had so much fear and anxiety, and I'm like a data person, so I was reading all the data, and I'm like, you're, you're going through all these, as a geriatric, they put you through like every single screening. <sighs> geriatric. Geriatric old with every screening, and um, every time you're waiting for those results or whatever, it's a little nerve-wracking, and she was like, you just have to use a mantra. And so she gave me a mantra. What's the mantra? Um... I'm in perfect. I'm in perfect health. My baby is in perfect health, and this pregnancy is going to go perfectly. And in some ways, it's just to replace me being like I'm an old. I'm <laughs> I love fucked. that expression. <laughs> You're an old. <laughs> well, because I'm always yelling about how the olds are running the country. I'm like, I don't want these olds running the country. They're so freaking old. There are so many old ones between Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden. Diane Feinstein's yeah. like in her 80s. Yeah, so's Pelosi. Yeah. No. I'm yeah. sorry, it's but wild. no. Um, so is Fauci. So yeah, she gave me this mantra, and it seems ridic- It feels a little ridiculous, although, I, and in some ways, it's like self-soothing. You know, it's just me being like a like a. I feel like I'm like rocking. I don't say it out loud, but it feels so much of this stuff is completely out of my control, and it feels like just a silly way of trying to feel like I have control over it. You know, it's not. It's not like if I don't say that mantra, shit's going to go sideways. Right, (laughs) right, right. Um, Are you taking vitamins? Of course, of course. I'm so, I am like so healthy. I'm such a healthy, whenever they do my blood pan, they're like, you're, my doctor said, she's like, you are in perfect health. When when I get my, um, you know, like my normal stuff. Are you exercising? Of course. I never stopped exercising. So, I just uh, kept doing what I was doing and right. continue so, to. In a lot of ways, it's like other things, right? Like you're preparing. You've yeah. done all the right things. You've done all the right work. You're nervous because it's you're made a fucking person inside your body, and it's, it's exciting. Crazy. It's and exciting. I and I don't want. And I'm so um, cautiously optimistic. Yeah, I think there is a part of me being. Like Irish, I don't know what it is, if it's like East Coast or Irish Catholic, but I'm like skeptical of good things. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very East Coast thing. You know where you're like, yeah. I don't know. You don't want to get too big for your britches. Right. <laughs> like, why Why do you think that's an East Coast thing? Is that I don't an immigrant know. thing? I don't I think it's an immigrant thing. That's like when you get sober and everyone's like, oh, look, you think you're better than, it's like you think you're better right. than everyone. Like right, getting right. pregnant at forty two, like yeah. you know, you're just like you want to. I want to keep my head down and avoid the wrath of the gods. That right, right. I'm skeptical of. I am. I there is like part of my nature that's so suspicious of of like. It's this. I'm the same way with business, though. I'm like, yeah, I'll believe it. I'll believe it when like the ink is dry. Right. You know, I'm not going to celebrate this deal until. But I could 
do that until I'm like holding a baby and the crib isn't even made yet. You know, right. like we'll see how it goes. <laughs> ah, fuck! I should have got a crib. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the difference between the East Coast and the West Coast is West Coast celebrates things before they ever happen. Right? Yeah, yeah. They like assume that everything's gonna go great yeah, and then deals the fall apart and you start doing coke. <laughs> Right? And you have like the justification for your, then yeah. you end up homeless on the beach. It's full circle. It's true though what you're saying about East Coast people are like, they don't want you to get too big for your bridges. No. Like, I feel like it must have to do with like being the children of immigrants. Is it? Or it's, it feels a little like crabs in a bucket too, like in that, the small towns. Yeah. I mean, oh, that yeah. towny privilege and mentality mm -hmm. is so, no one ever talks about towny privilege. It's real. When I go back to like my hometown and it's a resort town and now it's booming with tech money and it's really weird and it's created a whole dichotomy that was always latently there, but now it's even worse. Is it resentment? Well, because the housing has priced all the workers out of of the island, basically. Uh, and so, what island? It's a uh, Quitnick Island. Where so the fuck is that? Newport, Rhode Island. Oh. Yeah, but people are like, oh, you're from Newport. You, I'm like, N -n -n I'm. I don't use summer as a verb. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I am not. I am not that Newport. You don't <laughs> summer in the Hamptons. I'm not, using, mm, I'm not summer. But now it feels. When I went home, I was like, whoa, this feels a lot like it must have felt. Because it was the original playground of the rich. It's where the Vanderbilts had their mansion. And the Why Astors. There? Why there? It was right outside of New York City. It's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Sailing town. I mean, mm. I don't know, but it, it, I mean, have you been there and seen those mansions? I don't think I have. They're I've been to nuts. Rhode Island a bunch of times, but I haven't been to. It's first of all, it's been like twenty years since I did anything other than like comedy clubs there. Yeah. You know, just tour, like drop in, do a Newport's show. Newport's gorgeous, out. Out. but we were like blue collar Newport. We mm. weren't, you know, I was waiting on all the people that were right. summering there and taking care of their kids. And I grew up with a lot of class resentment that I still have to keep in check. There's like that writer, Jonah Goldberg, who's a conservative guy who always cracks me up and he's always like, don't do populism. <laughs> Because he's always like checking me on my populist. I could be AOC. We've talked about this. Yeah. I could easily lean into that. I grew up like really resenting the rich, and I have to, you know, watch that in myself. I'm fascinated to what, fascinated by what the Hamptons are. I have never been. I don't know what it's like to hobnob there, but it seems like like a really weird place where people who are all rich go to be rich together. Yeah, no, the, I mean, Newport is very similar in the summer. That, Have you been to the Hamptons? No, because it seems just like a worse version of Newport. But and it seems like so many of those like hobnobby people like Chris Cuomo and Matt Lauer and Howard Stern. Well, and, I know the all white and quotes beach club that like Senator Whitehouse, you know. What? All you know, white. It, you remember Senator Whitehouse was getting... Um, Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island. He when, when is this? This was recently over the summer. He was getting attacked for belong. It came out that he belongs to an all-white oh, beach club in right. Rhode Island. So that's I, right. I worked at that. I was a nanny for kids oh, at that beach club. Oh, this is Rhode Island, yeah. not the Hamptons. Not the Hamptons. We're back to the Ham Rhode um, Island. But it's very similar. Like the people who are members of this beach club are insanely old money, like Campbell's soup money. I mean, we're talking about old money. But does this money. mean that black people can't join? No, and that's what was wrong. I was talking to a New York, the New York Times reporter who was talking about this story. I'm like, it's not all white in policy, <laughs> but I've never seen a black person there. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not all white. It, it's not anywhere that you can't join, but the, it's definitely like, when, the last time I went there, just because somebody invited me to lunch there one time when I was home a couple of years ago, and I was like, holy shit, this, coming from L.A., which is diverse and anywhere, I was like, this is the whitest place I've been in so long. Even the staff was white, like e European, you know? I was like, this is crazy. Now, Every, is that, has anybody black tried to join there? That's a good question. I, I'm not sure. I think they, I'm not sure. I feel like somebody sued them at one point, but I think it was a Jewish family because they, I don't know that there were any Jewish oh, members of the Goyams. club either. Uh, oh no, this is wasp. Like, wasp yeah. Money. Oh yeah. yeah. It's old, old mm. money. And they're very, 
they kind of look down on even like Hampton's money because it's like new money. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's fucking old money. Newport oh is old God. money. And now there's all this new money in town and the old money hates it. And Wait, I had- Isn't that weird like that inherited money is somehow or another better? The there's money so, you earn. Those kids crack me up. I have a good friend and there was like this whole debate because Larry Ellison was going to buy this property and he was going to like, they, they were, then all the old money people got together and they were going to do something like um, sell all their properties below so that his view would be destroyed basically and his, his value would go down. And they were like, if you're going to act like new money, we're going to treat you like new money, Larry. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying by sell all his properties below. So they mean? all had properties in this area. He was going to buy a property and they didn't want him because they he was going to like build something huge and chop down the trees and, and do all this stuff. And they were like, we should sell all of our properties so that they get developed and it ruins his land value, basically. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was like listening to this, just laughing hysterically. That's the breakers. <laughs> What's that, Jamie? These are some of these. Cra- I just typed in Newport Mansions and just went to Google Images. God and damn! And they are really no, big. it's insane. Look, click on that one, in the upper right hand corner. <laughs> Look at that fucking place. Holy shit! Oh, that's not anything. I mean, the breakers is insane. Oh my god! I said even the inside. What size of that fucking? No, place. they're crazy, they're and it's oh. all like marble imported from Italy and. G- literally click gold on that house. leaf. Well, no, click on the house on the left of that, right there. Uh, that one. No, no, no. The there. one to the left. The one to the left of the big image. The you just no up right above that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So small. No, no, no. That's not the, the one, one, one below it. The one with the the yeah, beach. That one. That's it. Thank you. Oh my God! Look at that. Yeah, it's nuts. That's breakers right behind it. And there's this cliff walk that you can walk. All, I mean, Newport's, it's gorgeous. It's truly just beautiful, but it's- I think I did a gig the, there These are all the places day. that you tour now. They're owned by the, they're not owned, but they're run by the Preservation Society. I, nobody lives, lives in, in them. them? No. Oh. You, could, you, there, you couldn't put a price on what those, what is in those p- things from, this is all from the Gilded Age. It's interesting though, because it does feel like the wealth disparity in America right now is very similar to this this period in American yeah. history when there was just so much so much wealth and so much of a disparity between the rich and the poor. Oh my God, seventy eight million dollars! Oh, that's in the Hamptons. <laughs> yeah, that's so in the yeah, Hamptons. That's so I switching. I was comparing to the Hamptons to Four, what she was talking about. Fourteen bedroom home with a three hundred sixty degree view of the water in Southampton. Seventy eight million dollars. Oh yeah, the Hamptons is nuts. I mean that's where like Where's the house? Which doesn't, one's the house? Uh, doesn't Martha probably. Stewart have a house there? Isn't that where she or both of these? Who? Martha Stewart. I think she's Connecticut. I, she I mean I think she has a house in the Hamptons though too. too. This is all place. second houses. Seventy five million. Oh, that's seventy five million? Mm-hmm. You're getting robbed, kids. Ten acres. <laughs> Ten, what? I was just hanging out with Chris Rock. He's got or excuse me, Kid Rock. Oh, D- different okay. person. <laughs> Very uh, different. <laughs> I was hanging out with Kid Rock yesterday in uh, Nashville. Kid Rock has the fucking craziest spread you've ever seen in your life. He's got a church on his property oh, wow. that he's converted to something else. He's got a, uh, a a replica of the White House. I mean, he built a fucking White House on his property. <laughs> it's the most hillbilly, redneck, rich shit I've I ever seen in my it. life. It's a 27,000 square foot new house. New money. This is new but money, Joe. But it's a 27,000 <laughs> square foot house with two bedrooms. Old money he's got would a, never do this. He's got, oh yeah, for sure. He's got a, a giant gold elevator. As you walk into the house, he's, he's in the process of building it. And uh, he goes, a lot of people want to hide their elevators, but I'm like, fuck that. When you come to Kid Rock's house, I want him to say, shit, Kid Rock's got a motherfucking elevator right in the front. <laughs> so he's got a, a gold shower room. Oh, wow. Like it's like shiny gold tile, like this like glittery gold tile. The whole thing is like literally a is golden a shower room. His a whole house shower. is a party. Oh, okay. All it the time? It is a party house. It's mm, He's got a- I would hate that. Well, you're different than him, but he has a 20-person <laughs> jacuzzi. 
It's a giant 20 person jacuzzi with with like this with the filaments on the ceiling for stars uh-huh. And he's got like old reclaimed beams and these like gas lanterns that are hanging like an old mine shaft It's the craziest fucking place I've ever seen guy Fieri designed his kitchen Wow, he, he's got a bowling alley. He's Does got he a cook. Uh, I don't know. I think he hired How, a guy. He's that rich. Oh, Kid, or, Kid Rock is rich as fuck. Kid is, Rock murders it on the road touring. Murders it. Huh. Yeah. So he's got this huge fucking gym sauna area. I mean, I the house is 27,000 square feet. It has two bedrooms. Wow. One guest bedroom, one master bedroom. Wow. The view is fucking preposterous. The house is nuts. How many acres? 200 acres. Oh, wow. So I mean, fuck, fuck yeah. this Hamptons place. This yeah. is bullshit. 78 million bucks. You're getting fucked, kids. Yeah, but it's all about the hobnobbing. I don't know. I'd rather hobnob with Kid Rock. I'm going to be honest with you. These <laughs> yeah, people are probably like boring. He's hilarious. No, I've been, uh, I like I said, I grew up around that entire population, and it it, it, it it's something else. The pink pants and the whale yeah. belts. And the, the, old and the money. boat shoes. But the the fact that old money looks down on new money is so fascinating. <laughs> like, so you down didn't on even it. earn. You, you didn't even and inherit. And they didn't earn your, it. <laughs> yeah, that was saying that you didn't inherit your money. You didn't even <laughs> inherit your money. Mm. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't come from generations of money. You earned your money, like my great great grandfather did. Where did they get that money? Like who? Who? Like what was the business? Um, a lot. It's old money. It's like, like fiber Slavery. optics, <laughs> that and like Cam- fiber optics. no, literally like Campbell's soup, and oh. you know, old money, old like old oil money from Texas, and but those Newport houses look like they're from the 1800s. Oh, right? those houses, yeah. those are all the like um, the robber barons. You know, that was like the 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 Vanderbilts and yeah. the Astors and. The guys who built the railroads and made all like they all of those people had houses over there. <sighs> Fucking weird. No, that was a crazy time in history. But here's the thing about this disparity of wealth. Like, how does one balance that out without going full communist? Right, because like, when you when you think about it, there's a disparity <laughs> of wealth, like, don't we have take to deal my with money, it. Bridget. What do you? But how does how does one do it? Look, I'm the first person to say that I'd be more than happy to give up more money in taxes if I really thought that it would positively affect communities, if I really thought we could cure... Like some Look, of these like deeply impoverished communities that are ridden with crime and violence and drug abuse. And if there was a way to do that, and the way to do that is to pay more money in taxes. That's I'd, not it, though. It, right. it's, this, it's what you talk about a lot. And it's what my friend Carol Roth r- has written about and is just constantly on the great consolidation, as she called it, in an essay that I think she put out today, where we need to remove the barriers for people to have to take risks and start small businesses, there were 30 million small businesses before the lockdowns and pandemics and in pandemic. And it's most people don't understand that those small businesses are 50% of the American economy. And that consolidation between big government and special interests and all of that wealth being transferred up into the centralization that's occurring, like why Walmart was open and your small local place wasn't, why you could go, she uses the example in her article, why you could go get your dog's nails trimmed at PetSmart, but you couldn't go to your local hair salon, how it crushed all of these small businesses. But government, particularly the government we have now, doesn't necessarily like small businesses because they're decentralized. They represent decentralization. And so there's so many, and then just today they were talking about the um, unearned gains. Did you see this, Jamie? It was like unearned gains tax that they want. And Carol was saying, she's like, don't normalize this. This is just stealing from you. It's like not a real thing. She was what does that mean by unearned gain? Why don't you explain that better? Oh, unrealized. It, unrealized. Thank you. I'm not the the right person to explain even how this. But what's wrong with it? What is what is what are they saying? It's it's taxing you on 
how do you, how do I explain this? I'm so, so bad. So like this. unrealized gain would be uh, if you put a hundred dollars in a Tesla and it went up to a thousand dollars and your hundred turned into a thousand, taxing you on the nine hundred dollars that is existing in an account you don't actually have because it's you haven't made that money until you take it. Right. right. Sit that and they would be taxing that. So they would take money before you even withdrew money. Right. Right. Fucking criminals. Yeah, no, it's that's some criminal it's shit. Theft. <laughs> it really is. When they're just trying to find a way to build this build back better policy that's like to two thousand five hundred and fifty million pages long <laughs> yeah. and no one's read it. Yeah. No one's read it. They were trying to shovel that through. There was one congressman who was explaining and he showed it. He's like, This is the bill. Yeah. And he goes, Do you think Joe Biden's read this bill? Do you think Nancy Pelosi's read this bill? No, they they have interest inside that bill yeah and they are going to push that through and then when it goes through people are going to have to come to the realization that they didn't know what was in there right but when they say build back better you're like yeah we should but i we think should that's pass that bill right i but think what's in that fucking bill no no everything <laughs> <laughs> what isn't i Adrena think chrome yeah I, I think that that's the the that's the answer though is to create a robust middle class that's that's how instead of creating this massive welfare class that is dependent on big daddy for everything big yeah. daddy government which is driving this inequality you look at how much the you know these tech corporations while they're the fed is pumping money into the markets and meanwhile like cannibalizing main street the whole time and this is process has been going on but it just was exacerbated and so that's not going to help with the inequality yeah no it's what happened with small businesses and restaurants and, and various places that got forced into closing down while other places were open is is nothing short of ca catastrophic it's, it's, an, it's, it's another thing that makes my blood boil. Yeah, it's no, like, it makes me sick too because yeah. I know a lot of people who've lost businesses. We were hanging out with Tony Hinchcliffe's dad a couple of weeks ago in Pittsburgh. His uh, dad uh, had a, a restaurant that he ran for 30 years in Youngstown, and uh, now it's gone. It's, uh, gone. it's gone because they made him close it down during the pandemic. Yeah, so many small businesses just yeah. couldn't, they couldn't survive. Yeah. It's fucked. It's fucked. And there was no talk of revitalizing those businesses. Uh, I mean, I know there was some loans that were passed out to people. Is you know what's shocking? Like how many people um, were scamming? Like how many, yeah. how many how many people took those government loans and they just fucking they didn't deserve them. <laughs> they didn't need them. need them. They didn't need them or deserve them. Like rappers got busted. Yeah, yeah. Like, ugh, it's crazy. Anyone shit. with a corporation. Yeah. And then there was like the whole. Um, Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Georgia man used COVID-19 relief loan to purchase $57,000 Pokemon card. I thought this was America. <laughs> People are still buying Pokemon cards? I huh? guess. They're worth a lot of money. Are they really? Certain ones, yeah. That Remember like, when Pokemon, like people were driving down the street playing Pokemon? Oh, Pokemon Go? Yeah. That was nuts. It was scary. They were, they were all down by the Santa Monica Pier, That, like hundreds of them Wandering running around, around. Yeah. not looking. Yeah. Bump, bump it in shit. <laughs> this lady was driving and she had the Pokemon Go on her steering wheel. I was watching her do it. No. I was like this, because I was in a truck and I was looking down. I'm like, look at this crazy bitch. There's still people addicted to it. Are there? For sure. I know a few. But it Jamie's dropped like, off. I'm one of them. It dropped off. <laughs> yeah, but I'm like, right. how, how, it, that was four, how, how long ago was that? That was three or four years ago? Yeah. Maybe more? But isn't it crazy that like immediately it took off and then most people came to their senses. They're like, what are we doing? <laughs> you know? But a lot of people didn't. We need people to come to their senses. Yeah. We do, but is it gonna happen? Do you have faith? That was worried? one of, that was one of my questions for you is what gives you hope? Because I've heard a lot of your recent um, episodes and it seems like, you know, we can talk about how crazy it is and know it is, and I don't know what you or I could do about anything really. Uh, other than run our mouths, but I think running our mouths actually does help. Okay, I really do. I think you help. I really do. You're a voice of reason. Yeah, but what are you hopeful? Yes. What gives you hope? Because I think people are going to get fed up. I think there's enough people that are going to get fed up, and I think genuinely evil scumbags trip up. And they keep tripping up. And I don't think they can keep the charade up for very long. What I'm nervous about is the damage that they do before they get busted, mm. before it all falls apart on them. I'm, I'm nervous about the victims. The victims, whether it's small businesses or whether it's children or what, whatever I think that's going to go wrong while they just look to extract money, right? Like, this is my fear, is that... <sighs> 
health mandates, certain things are going to be made that aren't in the best interest of people, but are in the best interest of profit. Mm. And that scares the shit out of me because I think there's going to be victims along the way. But I think the more they push good people with these really fucking preposterous ideas, the more people are going to get fed up. Like what's mm-hmm. happening in Australia when people are like storming these cops and like, like they won't, they won't listen and they're running down the streets. You you can only push good people for so long before they get together and figure it out. What's fucked about Australia is they don't have guns. Yeah. You know, I mean, Australia, they're they're literally disarmed. Yeah. And they don't have the same sort of power in terms of freedom of speech and expression. Yeah, that yeah. Do. That's really the it's biggest different. thing. It's the yeah. biggest thing. I and think they want to crack down on and that's one of the reasons why I'm so angry about tech censorship. Yeah. Because I don't think they understand how dangerous this is. Because you can use these tools against your enemies now, but they will be used against you tomorrow. Yeah. You need to understand this. And I tell everyone who's not too big to fail, um, because I think there are certain people who they don't necessarily have to worry about the tech censorship as much, although they did like do a hit job on our past president. <laughs> they took um, out. So they, I don't think anyone is necessarily as safe as they think, but I definitely have had to create a lot of plan B's for myself. I'm on Rumble with Glenn Greenwald. I'm on Locals where I have all my video and the event that I get disappeared from there. How many people do you have on Locals? Um, Well, I have people who can follow me and they can just follow me and it's at fantasy.com and then I have people who can subscribe. So So, it's kind of like Patreon. But but you could just follow me and I leave a lot of stuff just open. You know, like I'll just open it up. It's like some of it is public and some of it's just behind the paywall. And this is on fantasy.com? You can do that? Yeah. So like Rumble is totally open. That's like my public facing version of YouTube. Yeah. And so Rumble is uncensored, right? Yeah, they, I mean, they have, like, rules, like, n- you know, no freaking, you can't be, like, an open racist and stuff like that. But I appreciate Rumble because at least I know what what worries me about, like, YouTube, <laughs> it's like a joke. We flatlined at 49, we don't get a single new subscriber. We're like, I think we're in some weird algorithmic 100%. black hole. Yeah. And it's not like they're demonetizing us yet, but that will happen as it happened to Brett and Heather. And so you kind of, um, I at least know on Rumble that none of that stuff's going to happen because I'm talking about how boys and girls are different and I'm against the vax ports. When I had um, that COVID thing happen, um, there was an immediate drop off on the number of people that I got every day on uh, Instagram. Oh, interesting. And I think I got put into some weird category. They put you in like a, it's like an algorithmic black hole. Yeah, and it's fascinating yeah. because the amount of likes for stuff hasn't changed. So the same amount of people are still checking my stuff, but the amount of new growth, it's just like, uh, hit yeah. the brakes. And you can say that's because people think you suck now. But I have a feeling it's more complicated than that because that whole Sanjay Gupta thing was pretty positive for me overall yeah. in terms of the the way the general public re- related to what I was saying versus what he was saying. Yeah. You know, in, in terms of like CNN lying you weren't, and catching them lying. Yeah, that was egregious. But the thing is, the there was a there's something happened and some there was like and I I might be I might be like looking too far into this and maybe I'm wrong, but it seemed like there was a tangible slowing down of growth yeah yeah that happened to me on twitter after something that i did or said and i've seen it and i try not to be paranoid and i'm i'm also just like well it's private business and i'm just happy to be here so there is that aspect of me i feel that that aspect fuck that aspect because like one of the things we know massive but we know because of project veritas right you know, which is interesting because people demonize Project Veritas, right? But we know because of their work, because of their conversations that they've had where they recorded these conversations that the people didn't know, where they've talked about putting people on these lists. Right. They've talked about making sure that people are shadow banned. Right, making right. Making sure that... and. You know, they just admitted recently, was it Facebook that admitted recently that conservative ideas uh, and that conservative people get treated differently? Right. Do you know fucking there was a thing on CNN where they were, where that 
Brian Stelter guy was actually saying we should start treating Republicans differently than we treat Democrats. Yeah, this this the othering that's been going on is really unsettling othering, and disturbing yeah. to me. And it's, it's been going on since Trump, you know, in that yes. the people many of us have been talking about the self censorship that's been going on. This process of keeping your mouth shut and just going along has been going going on for some time, but now it's extended to like masks and vaccines and and I think that you will push people to a point where they're like, fuck this. I know so many people right now who are having to choose between going to work or getting the vaccine. And yeah. that and some of them are lucky enough to be in a position to make that decision. If you're not in a position to make that decision, it's not really a choice. You know, they try and make it like, oh, it's voluntary. It's like it's not a fucking choice. This was something that was lost during the pandemic with wealthy people that I experienced where a lot of people are like we need the lockdowns. We need it. And I'm like, you have money. You right. fuck. You don't have a business that's rotting away that you work for for 30 years like Tony's dad. Right. Where you're fucked. Like, right. You don't have anything. You're you have a lot of money. So you're happy. Right. You know, these Hollywood fucks that were like, you know, we need to keep things locked down. We need to stop the spread and everyone needs to stay inside and not go anywhere. That was like, my piece. Lectures from Lindsay yeah. and li liberals. It's like you guys got to like stay home and post your pictures of sourdough. And you had your, yeah. as my friend Carol Markowitz calls it, pajama jobbers, which I love. And then sneer at all these people who worked through the whole pandemic because exactly. they didn't have a choice. Because the real choice was people who got to stay home and people who didn't. Yeah. And that's just been now blown out into people who want to get the vaccine, people who don't. And it's the othering. That language is unsettling. Yeah, it's othering across the board, right? They find ways to use othering, but it really is othering. And I don't, I don't like that because it, does, it doesn't, you know, the, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for podcasts because I do think, I joke like podcasts are going to save the world. And I do think that these long form conversations have exploded in popularity in this time when everything is crazily polarized and people are very confused yeah. like you said when you are openly lying about what they said about you then catching them in the lie and then doubling down on the lie one or two more times yeah you're losing credibility and we have a massive credibility crisis with all of our institutions and people then are much more likely to fall into conspiracy theories and you know, exactly. you, that's what's so And they think so the solution dangerous. to that is to censor those conspiracy theories. And it theories. makes them even more well, conspiratorial. If, as long as places like Rumble exist, you know, and th I think they're going to grow. I think that place is going to grow. Yeah, I love, I love the owners. I love them. Um, I really, Tulsi's on Locals now. I love, I love like. She's on Rumble. She's on Rumble and, and locals. locals. Yeah. I think this is one of those things where they fucked up enough where the, the, the grip has slipped to the point where enough people are going to, first of all, we'll, we'll keep saying the name Rumble, right? Keep saying it. Yeah. Get, get people to keep going over there. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not over there, but I certainly would be, although somebody's probably pretending to be me there already. <laughs> I like but, it over there, and it's, we don't get the same amount of engagement, but then what's happened- But for now, you don't. What's happened with us, but our growth has been, we'll probably have 50,000 subscribers on freaking Rumble before we do on YouTube, and I've been there for two years, and I'm not kidding you, it's like- all of our numbers just flatlined, and every week they like go down. What did you do where they flatlined? Was, that, was there a particular really, episode? It's the women thing. I've been going so hard uh, on the trans stuff. Yeah, I, I haven't been going hard on the trans stuff, but I have been going hard on. Yeah, I guess it's the trans stuff. It's the trans <laughs> stuff. It is. It is. It's because just, it's by without even saying it, without being negative about trans no. people, by saying we need to support the idea that it's okay to say women get pregnant and women give birth and women breastfeed. It's not chest feeding people. I just don't. I, I think that women have fought for the. It's funny because my English teacher told me that I was a disgrace to feminism when I was like in high school. She was like, because I was like, what's wrong with opening doors for women? I don't see what the problem is. And I was not really like all on board with the feminist thing. And now I feel like I have become like a radical feminist. But it's changed. <laughs> but, but hold on. The threat has changed. Well, it's a very different the prison threat. shit drives me crazy. That's oh, yeah. another That's one that evil. makes my blood boil because we're talking about w those women's, r you know, like human rights. That's a human Explain rights violation. Explain what you're violation. talking about, though. So in California in particular, but we're see you're seeing this in the UK as well. 
you can just self-identify as a woman and get transferred into a female prison. And there, there's no stopgap on this, even if you are a sex offender or you're, you're somebody who has been abusive to women, they will still transfer you into these prisons. You and also don't need hormonal You don't need any. You used to have to need like yeah. replacement therapy. You'd need psychology. You would be, have to be on medications. And I, I just think that that is insane. And now you're hearing about women being raped. And in the UK, there was that recent thing that, I, that they came out and said you'd get a harsher, you'd get extended sentence if you misgender a woman in your prison. In prison. Yeah, it's in like- prison. So you're a woman. You're in a woman's prison. A biological male with a dick intact without taking any hormones, comes into your prison. If you call that biological male a he, they will keep you in jail longer with him. I was joking on Dumpster Fire. I'm like, it's going to get to the point where you're like, he raped me. And it's like, that's extra time for you, young lady. Yeah. (laughs) Like, it's so... Yeah. And it's fucking crazy. And it's people know it's crazy. Everyone knows this is crazy. So how does it get passed through? Um, in California, I mean, it's not everywhere, so it's in California, but the, the, the stuff is crazy. You know, this is where Abigail Schreier has been amazing on, on like the stuff in California where you can basically like trans the kid without telling the parents that's bananas to me that you can do that to a child and that, um, and she was talking about how in California we're in kind of a precarious moment because right now we at least have data about who is self-identifying as a woman and being transferred into a woman's prison but once it gets to a point where they can just have self-identify on an id we won't we'll lose the ability to even track who's going into these women's prisons and is a biological male so it's just it, it seems like it's And again, this is a population that people are ostensibly like, we need to, you know, the women in prisons are often, and they are, they don't, no one speaks for them. Who's speaking for these women? And this is the population we're supposed to be caring about and worrying about. And where is the concern and the worry? And I do think like that whole We Spa thing where they were like, oh, this is just a scam. And then you find out the guy is a freaking registered sex offender and has another case pending. Yeah. Or the the woman. No, the guy. (laughs) Whatever. Um, if you still have your penis, you're not trying. I will I will be a polite person and call you whatever the hell you want. If you want me to call you Elmo right now, Joe, I'll call you that. That's so sweet. <laughs> Megan Murphy's very hardcore about that. Have you ever listened to her stuff about it? Yeah, well, until she got like banned from Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> I know. But that's the thing. People, I, I say, we know this is nonsense. And people know it's ridiculous. And if you, But let me ask you this. But, but people are afraid. But how did it get so far? Uh, I mean, this is a question that I have. I have like, there's a conspiracy theory side of me to this. Because, I want to hear that part. Oh God, do That's you? That's the fun one. Yeah. So there's apparently like the trans movement is um, really backed by the George Soros. No, the black helicopters. The people who. Um, it's like a stepping stone to being transhuman, and so you can. You can basically kind of like get people used to the idea of like switching out body parts and putting, you know, microchips and getting a new arm that's biomechanical and and so that you can go live on other planets and also okay, this is just the conspiracy. But who's they? This is um, the thing about these well, conspiracies. Like who's, no, there's, who's I organizing just, I this? I don't know that I I can't remember the name right now, but there's this billionaire, George Soros, and no. Um, God, do I even want, I don't even know, like, I'm scared to, like, draw the, draw out the, att- this is how scared I am of this conspiracy th- I'm, I'm aware of my fear of this conspiracy theory, as I'm like, I don't want to mention the name publicly, because I don't want to die. <laughs> Wait a minute, you, you're worried this conspiracy is real, then? I, I'm worried that these forces are, because this is my question, how did this get so mainstreamed? How did it get so mainstreamed in our policies well have you ever listened to douglas murray talk about this what's his theory douglas murray said that during the collapse of a civilization 
all civilizations become obsessed with gender. Uh-huh. And that the Greeks and the Romans, they all did this. They, they become obsessed with switching roles and that rules aren't rules anymore. And that in this it's like chaotic state. Yes, mm. exactly. Exactly. Interesting. Well, I do know that the certain billionaire. What's they, his fucking name? <laughs> it's her name now. Oh, it's a woman? Well, it's a trans woman. Uh, and is it that person? Uh, nope. Okay. Um, you just shamed her for no I reason. I didn't put it that person on the. You son of a bitch. It's just for you too. Um, okay. and <laughs> and they have a lot of money in biotech. Who the fuck is it? I can't remember her name. Lies, um, liar. <laughs> no, I really oh can't. I always forget. How dare you? Uh, and where? The, what country are they from? America. But they have a company in Canada where they can get, like, do a lot more biotech research that we can't do in the United States. What kind of shit? It's a rabbit hole. I don't necessarily need everybody to be going down. Anyway, this person is a lawyer, and I think that they they've perhaps been very influential in a lot of these cases that are fighting to get these policies. Because how how what's your theory? What is your theory? I think Douglas Murray's theory makes more sense. I think there's a there's a trend going on that uh, doesn't. I don't think a but there's like, one individual be money person involved. could possibly uh, not, not necessarily. I mean, I don't think a... one individual person is capable of manipulating things at the scale that it's happening right now. I think the way it's happening now, it seems to be like a psychological trend that coincides with a change in our culture. But there is money involved. I mean, think of all the money that the right the, like hormones reassignment surgeries. Right, but there's an industry to that, right? Like, if you are spending money, that means you, you someone's making that money. Yeah, that I mean, hospitals that, are making money off these surgeries. Well, there's going to be some of that. There's going to be, and there's also people that are that have already transitioned that are encouraging other people to do so as well. You know, they, there's like people that feel like it was a good thing for them, want other people to do it, and so they're more active in getting people to do it. I, I wish that there was a way you could actually become a woman, like with a pill. Yeah. Like, or a fucking, you walk into a transformer machine, and then you can go back and forth. Like, and I tried it. Yeah, I'd be a woman for a couple of days just to see what the fuck you guys were thinking. I mean, it's not fun. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> no. You seem to be having fun. I, I, I was, I had the worst penis envy my whole really? life. Yeah, my whole life. I mean, you I think, think I like... absolutely would have, like, trans if i transitioned if i was a really? if i was like a young influential teenage girl on online you mean easily influenced yeah yeah easily influenced sorry yeah. yes um if i was yeah i don't know i think a lot about that if i was 13 and online and didn't have this parental supervision and i was reaching out into the the void of the internet and and didn't really like being a woman because i was going through puberty and felt uncomfortable and also was just kind of jealous cuz the boys seemed to have more fun Mm. I probably would have been well, all in. It's uh, when I look at aliens, <laughs> when I look at the bodies. <laughs> Do you have aliens in here? In here, where? Somewhere in your no, house. <laughs> no, they come. They don't come. They 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 or they don't stay. They just come. They visit. But when I look at it, the archetypal alien, right? They have the giant heads, and then they have these bodies that don't have any muscle tone to them or <laughs> sexual organs. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's where we're going. I think what aliens are, what aliens are, when we look at those iconic images, like from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm-hmm. that archetypal alien. I think what we're seeing is where what our future is. Like if, we're transcending gender. Because yes, if we go back to uh, the early primates, the early hominids. Right? What did they look like? Well, they were really muscular and hairy. Mm-hmm. And then as you get closer to us, we're really doughy and we lose our <laughs> hair. You know, we're like smushy. Even like muscular people, if you touch them, they're so soft in comparison to like a chimp. Mm-hmm. If you feel a chimp's body, it feels like wood. It is like pure, just muscle. They're just yeah. J- but they're not just jacked, they're dense. Yeah. They're dense in a different way. Like they feel different. And I think that as we get weaker and softer and then we have more ability to manipulate our environment through technology we're going to have less and less need for muscle yeah and i think that as we become more and more integrated with technology like physically integrated where technology and us have technology and human beings have a symbiotic relationship that's inseparable like we will develop 
technologies that allow humans and technology to integrate because the only other option is artificial life. Because if we create artificial technology or artificial intelligence, if we create, and it's not even artificial life, but it would be like silicon-based, electrical-based life, right. like life that's created through humans, that's our demise. That's going to be the end of, of the human animal because it'll be able to be sentient. Once it's sentient, it'll be able to create more advanced versions of itself because it won't have the limitations of the human mind. Right. So the exponential increase in technology and innovation will spread so rapidly and so fast. They will improve upon all the systems to the point where we will be fucked. Yeah. It, it, it will experience thousands of years of evolution in terms of technological evolution in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And I think the way to get through that is we integrate, and that's what you're looking at when you look at aliens. Mm. What you're looking at is these tiny bodies with no genitals, <laughs> and they, they talk with their minds, and they have enormous heads because their brains are fucking huge. Just like our brains are far larger than, than ancient man so, and ho ancient hominids. So you think this is just the, the trans kind of phenomenon is just a it's a transitionary period for us. Yeah, I think we're going to realize that hormones in general and s the desire to reproduce sexually in general causes so many problems and so much so much of what we uh, look at is inevitable, like tribal warfare, uh, controlling resources, like the, the, the ego, all these different things are connected to biological life. It's connected to this need to breed, this need to, uh, to, to be dominant over the other people. The other, the other, like the reason why people want dictators, like why, why do dictators want control? They want to be dominated over the other humans. It's a natural tribal instinct mm -hmm. to want to be the leader, mm -hmm. want to be the one that tells the others what to do. It's, I mean, it has to be natural because it's the default position for most cultures. Most cultures have a guy who's the leader, like the, the guy who's the head of the Philippines, the guy who just fucking shoots people, oh, like yeah. kills journalists, kills drug That's dealers. Not... Yeah, that, but this is a default position yeah. to be the dictator. What's going on in Myanmar, what's going on in all, all, all parts of the world where there's dictators mm -hmm. and they, they run with an iron fist. What's happening with it, China? This is in North Korea. This is like the default position in more cultures than not. Well, right. what is that? I think it's connected to our b biological reward system for breeding and for dominance and to, to establish this, uh, this, this hierarchy in terms of breeding. Mm. I think once we get past that, like as a race, and I think it's gonna be a long process. I don't think it's gonna happen in our lifetime, but it could happen within the next thousand years. Hmm. And I think a thousand years from now, I guarantee that there'll be something that entices us to abandon the idea of breeding. Like let's like you were talking about. I mean, about, it's being abandoned. <laughs> but look at this way. You were well. Also, like the the thing with um, Dr. Shanna Swan, where she was talking about um, phthalates and how phthalates are literally causing phthalates, were, which are chemicals that are um, being ingested into the human body inadvertently through plastics and leaking through uh, d d different pesticides and different things, are causing our uh, sex organs to shrink. Is causing sperm counts to drop by over 50%, somewhere around 50%, I don't, I don't want to say over, uh, but between the uh, invention of petrochemical products and the, the use of them in our society mm -hmm. to now, sperm counts have dropped 50%. Wow. And they're directly coincided with the increase in the exposure to phthalates. And these phthalates, it's, it's spelled with a P, but it's, it's the, like phthalates, mm -hmm. but it's, these phthalates cause the shrinking of your taint which is apparently in baby mammals the best way to indicate male or female. Oh, wow. Because taints on males generally are 50 to 100% larger than on females, but they're shrinking over time with our exposure to phthalates. Huh. The book is terrifying. And the, the conversation I had with her, first of all, she's this lovely lady. She's this <laughs> tiny little woman, and she's really funny. Like, she has on her, um, she's like, she makes it fun to talk about the demise of the human animal. Oh, okay. Because on her Instagram, she has the jizz quiz, and the, the jizz quiz is all about, like, like how our sperm counts are, are lowering I and lowering. I keep reading about this, and just sex drives going down in general, yeah, and book, people aren't breeding as much. I was just telling something about her, was telling someone, rather, about her book, but it's, it's fucking excellent. So. It's called Countdown. 
This, oh, is, wow. this is the book. Okay. It's really good. I'll read but it. it's really scary because we've put these things out into the world and people are ingesting them inadvertently through leakage and you know but they didn't know about the real damage till geez do you remember from the podcast jamie i want to say like the tens right 2000 it was like 2011 or 2012 where they started figuring out like oh my god these phthalates that they can exhibit these changes in mammals mm -hmm. they can sh they can study these changes in mammals where they introduce phthalates into their diet and they show their taints shrinking and their penis is shrinking and then the, also miscarriages rise wow. uh, uh, fertility drops radically that these these are observable in mammals and now we're seeing the same trend statistically in human beings wow you you do do you think this is a good thing no okay no it's so a thing even, though even like the it, evolution as you kind of mentioned it to like let's say aliens and genderlessness and and no need to procreate is that something that's good well what is good there's a problem define good is it good to a person that's a, a female that likes sex with males no it's bad. It's See, if you if you like a man, if you like men, like an actual man, like a manly man that grabs you. Yeah, I you, guess that's a good point. Right? If you're a man and you like women, you like sexy bodies with like proportions that are like traditionally like sexually attractive to men. No, it's not good if that's what you like. <laughs> but because that's going to go that away. But at that point, it wouldn't even you probably wouldn't even know what you're missing. Well, I think what's gonna happen is there's gonna be something that's much more attractive, whether it's some sort of a technological thing. It's just, there's gonna be something that they can introduce into the human body that is, makes it obsolete. That, so the feelings that you get, whatever good feelings you get, like when a man and a woman are attracted to each other, it'll be far better than that, and you don't have to worry about all the messiness of fucking. Right. And all the messiness of like, but I mean, imagine if we could, um, if just there was one thing, like see what we're doing to stop COVID, right? What if we had something that would eliminate all rape forever? Right. Forever. So this is like, we're, we're gonna have to all bite the bullet and get our organs removed because we don't need them and we're gonna eliminate all sex. It would and just, we're gonna reproduce through this machine that we've right. all, and, and everybody has to have a machine in your house and you're allowed to have one baby. So it just be, it would just make, make evolutionary sense well, even it's if it's also not you logical. can't be selfish bridget we're gonna what are we gonna do we're gonna ruin the world with overpopulation don't be selfish no I'm we're so all selfish. gonna get our organs removed <laughs> and we're all gonna decide that this is the way we reproduce and the government's gonna d dictate <laughs> how many like the people... organ removal mandate coming down the pipe listen this is where it all goes <sighs> when you lose bodily autonomy I, when i'm you, not a fan when you of lose it the, but that's what's happening that's what's happening I, people I'm don't aware. understand this slippery slope these fucking dummies that are like, yeah, you should get mandated because I did it. I got my shot. You I should just, get your shot. Take the damn shot. I don't. You know, Keith, that Olbermann? Keith Olbermann. Yeah. <laughs> Take the damn shot. You're scared. Mister, You're scared. What did he call he you? me Mr. Afraid. Oh, my, wow. What a good How writer he is. How did you survive from that sick burn? It was hard. It was hard. It hurt. Yeah. It cut to my to the marrow. Yeah, I, I I definitely feel like that's uh that's what I don't understand is if these things I just want someone to explain it to me because I was vaccinated under the impression that then I'm cool. Tim and Dillon had a great bit on it. Why do I need to give a fuck about what anyone else is doing if I got my vaccine? That's what I don't understand is this like crazy obsession to everyone must get this. Because you're thinking logically. <laughs> it's, it's about human control. Humans love to control other humans. And if they can't control humans individually, they like to. to control. No. I mean, you're kind of like, whatever, get a vaccine. Don't. Like, you're That's not. That's exactly right. Well, I tell, my, I tell my fat friends to get vaccinated, by the way. You should. I do. I tell my mom to get vaccinated. I tell, I tell a lot of people to get vaccinated. The olds, the fats. The thing is, like, <laughs> this is what people don't want to hear, is that it's not the only option. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that there are therapeutic options. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to hear that you should be healthy. But no, one no of the, one wants to hear that. For my narrative, one of the best things that could have happened to me was getting COVID. Because mm. look how quick I got over it. Yeah, you're healthy. Yeah, exactly. But I also took the right medication. Yeah. Despite what CNN This says. is the other question, too, because my is like how how easy is it for the average person to have the kind of treatment that you got, for instance? Monoclonal antibodies are available everywhere. Okay. And they're available for free. If you okay. Have, I, I don't know if it's if you have insurance or not in Texas, but in Texas they have them for free. But... 
that's another Fauci thing. And then we need to Google this to make sure this is true. But my doctor friend told me that Fauci is attempting to limit the availability of monoclonal antibodies because uh, through his words, my friend's words, not mine, not Fauci's, that they are trying to discourage this as an option for unvaccinated people because it's so effective. Because mm. they want people to just get vaccinated. Well, that article that I sent you crazy. from CNN today was him being like, I've been a big proponent of these and I don't know what the problem is and why you can't find them. So I don't, I don't. Well, this is also the guy that told you wasn't involved in gain of function <laughs> yeah, research and also the guy who didn't bother to tell everybody they were torturing puppies. Well, yeah. So. so that's, that's just what I wonder because, you know, as we, we know our health insurance is fucked. And I think that, um, I was just curious when I was seeing, like when you threw the kitchen sink at it, I, I was like, well, would I be able to afford that or get that treatment? Well, all the other stuff is not expensive. Like z packs. Yeah, yeah. That's not expensive. Um, prednisone is not that expensive. And I don't even know if prednisone is good. I've been told by another friend of mine who's a doctor that prednisone was not a good option. Mm. And they said that prednisone actually can inhibit your immune system. I don't know. Can, Look, can a all pregnant I know is, woman take horse dewormer, Joe? <laughs> that's a good question. That's a good question. Like, is it a good thing to take if you're pregnant? Yeah. I don't fucking know. I mean, nobody knows. I have no, nobody I have no knows. idea. I have no idea. Yeah, but I do know that they're running studies on ivermectin. They're running, there's multiple studies. There's a study going on in the UK. There's a study going on. Up, I want to say it's in North Carolina or South Carolina, but they wouldn't be doing this. Also, here's another thing. 200 Congress people were treated with ivermectin. I know. That's what I was reading somewhere. This idea that this is a horse dewormer is so ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't. It's been given to billions of people. Do you yeah. know there's only 59 million horses on earth itself? <laughs> they gave out 90 million doses this year so far of ivermectin, I think, something like that. Yeah. There's only 59 million horses. Like the idea that this is for horses is so fucking stupid. Even those stories that were coming out about um, all the people who are calling into the poison control. Lies. When you dig down, it's like two people called. But it's not even just that. <laughs> like the Rolling people. Stone story was a full on lie. Rolling Printed, Stone is a joke, though. But how much of a joke? Think I about mean, this. I mean, they've been a joke since they had to retract that gang rape story. Right. Yeah, the Virginia. I mean, story. I think they lost their credibility. But long this is ago. really crazy because they said that there were gunshot victims waiting in line <laughs> to get to the ER because so many people in there were overdosing on horse paste. Now, here's where it's a lie. You have to take a fuckload of ivermectin, whether it's horse paste or the other, to, to actually have to get uh, to go to the hospital right. to get overdose. Imagine that many people just gobbling <laughs> pounds of ivermectin. Second of all, the photo that Rolling Stone used was people outside wearing winter coats. Right. And it was in fucking August in Oklahoma. <laughs> it's, so it's so dumb. Yeah. It's so dumb. That's why people don't believe anything. They shouldn't believe everything. No, they shouldn't. But you don't. Where do people go to believe anything? Um, I was trying here to find this. The Poison control centers are fielding a surge of ivermectin overdose calls. Yeah, you know what? Wasn't like four of them. It was yeah. seriously. Instead of like they said it was like seventy percent. Yeah. Their phones it's being overrun. It's a surge, Jamie. It was. Yeah, You're the, causing vaccine hesitancy. That's my favorite. <laughs> You're contributing to vaccine hesitancy by telling about your friend who had a stroke. But. People are already hesitant. Yeah. I mean, this, this, somebody isn't, somebody, w people have a right to be skeptical. I read this, actually, the I think it was like the Wall Street Journal just did an opinion piece about you, about, they're like, it's time that we admit that Joe, like the way we framed Joe was dishonest or something. It was recently. Duh. But at the end, his big point was like, it's okay for people to be skeptical. I'm like, yeah, no shit. That's what all you, me, people who have been raging against this have been saying is allow people the space to have questions and not delete their video off YouTube if they do. But they're still doing it though. They're do doing it like crazy on YouTube. You know, and they won't allow you to have any mention of ivermectin. It makes people more skeptical. Yeah, if you have like ivermectin videos on YouTube, you most certainly will be demonetized. Yeah. You, you mean, and you probably get a strike against you. I mean, the Weinsteins have had strikes against their their Dark Horse channel. I know they've yeah. they've been through a lot with this. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, but it's crazy because they're having conversations with 
evolutionary biologists yep. and virologists and vaccine and specialists and we can't take away the ability to be skeptical and ask questions that also, is so dangerous also you can't take away the ability for literal scholars in the field of question discussing things yeah yeah when you are some fucking woke dipshit with a nose ring and blue hair yeah these like are the people who have keyboards. locked galileo up exactly it's like you you have to be able to have this kind of scientific inquiry in yes. your society and to and the more that you try and push this one thing the more people are gonna be like eh, well it's also starting to be a little suspicious there's so much anxiety in the air and most people are cowards and in the face of cowardice in the face of fear a lot of times people just conform and they get angry when other people don't conform along with them. Do and if they can find some sort of a rationale for shaming you or belittling you because you don't also conform, even if it denies the existence of all sorts of evidence to the contrary, even if it like flies in the face of a narrative that has existed forever, which is don't trust pharmaceutical companies because <laughs> they use people like goddamn ATM machines. Because yeah. they just extract money from you and sell you medications that you don't necessarily need. And they also work with politicians to make sure these things are, are available. And they also have a revolving door with the FDA where they take people who used to work for the FDA and then they put them into fucking nice cushy jobs at these pharmaceutical companies. I was I was joking about how I chose the you know, I chose the brand that like got sued for the baby powder. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, like, Dave Chappelle has a funny joke about it, too. Oh, yeah. I saw it on a special. He's very um, funny. It's just. Fuck. Yeah, I I just it it's a very it's a very strange time, and I wonder how much of it is people are yes people can be cowards, but how much of it is also just they're being forced into an impossible choice, i.e., keep your job or get a shot, and it's just about putting mouths. You know, I'm like people when you're faced with like ideology, and putting food on the table. Yes, people are being forced to they're make. Forced. They're you you can't. Not everyone choices. is rich enough to like stand behind their principles. Right. And most people aren't going to do that anyway. <laughs> most people are scared. Yeah. And then this is a, a it's a strange like colliding of ideas because you have at the same time people that are being forced to make these choices in order to keep their jobs while we're exposing <laughs> lies about these people that are pushing this in the first place. Like, it's as this house of cards is falling, they're getting more and more aggressive I know. about pushing these narratives. Instead of like slowing down and, and instead of like exploring treatments, and instead of like having a real open conversation about the risk versus reward of using these vaccines on children, instead of like looking at like, hey, this myocarditis that you say is mild, what is the data? Yeah. Show me what's the data on people recovering from this. Yeah. What's, what's the data on these young boys that are more prone to myocarditis because of these vaccines, particularly the Moderna vaccine, which, by the way, they're pulling in many of these countries for people under 30. Yeah. But outside the U.S., there's other countries that are saying, no, we, we this m these adverse reactions that people are having to the Moderna vaccines are call it, causing us to pause. Yeah. But we have a very strange relationship with pharmaceutical drug companies in this country. Yeah. This is one of only two countries on planet Earth where the pharmaceutical drug companies are allowed to advertise. I know. If you ever talk to Europeans about watching American television, they're always just blown away by how many yeah. pharmaceutical ads there are. And I like to, just, you know, you can tell a lot about the audience. Like I was watching like a Fox show and it's like, oh, the, the olds are watching this show based on the, the pharmaceuticals. But with like CNN, it's all like ads for pharmaceuticals for like schizophrenics. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, oh, anti depression. So the crazies are watching yeah. this channel. Yeah. Well, the, the anxiety ridden people are watching CNN. The, yeah. the liberals, it's all for like whatever an reason. Anxiety. First of all, I think there's a, probably a direct correlation between the lack of guns in the household and them being anxiety ridden. <laughs> Because for real, and do you know how many fucking liberal friends that I have that are, and again, it seems like now, looking for guns again? Yeah, again? It seems like it's ramped up again. Yeah, oh, we it, went through this the last time I was here. All of our liberal chain, friends were calling us. The supply chain. Which, yeah, they are. But the supply chain is changing uh, access to, to um, certain things like bullets and stuff. Like 
It's really hard to get bullets right now. And people are kind of freaking out. I've had people talk to me about how to get bullets. It's so weird, too, because we were, you know, I think a lot about, like, the flight people, the, all the flight attendants, the pilots. Like, we're, they, they were flying through the whole pandemic. Yep. They were, I went to freaking South Africa in February in the middle of the, like, South African strain, which they're not allowed to call those things anymore. And it was. Can you call it an English strain? I bet you could. If there was a strain in England. Probably. The English strain. Yeah. Oh, fine. <laughs> the English Meanwhile, thing. English is a, England is a very diverse place now. Yeah. Like it's not we think of English as being all white people. You go over to English you find a lot of people from Pakistan, from yeah, Africa. Yeah, yeah, it's very diverse. It's very diverse. But if you had an English strain, you might be able to pull it off. <laughs> I right? mean, it, it did it was funny to me that you couldn't call it I was like, well, they can't call it like the Chinese virus, but they're calling it the South African strain. This right. seems like a very strange conflict. Well, the, the really super hardcore conservative TV shows like OAN and oh, Newsmax. The, yeah, those are real The hardcore right. ones, those <laughs> ones all call it the Chinese flu. Oh, do they still? <laughs> the Chinese virus. That's the what, Chinese virus. That's what freaking Trump called our that's next president, probably. That's why they do it, because <laughs> their, their supporters are probably like, yeah, I love how they call it the Chinese virus. Do you think he's, I mean, I was so wrong. I thought for sure, I thought for sure he was going to win. I wrote a whole piece about what I got wrong, and I've been wrong about so many things. And the last time I sat down with you, I think it was right before, was it after the election? Or right before it? I there's, think it was right before there's it. There's enough people that were terrified of him, and the media did a really good job of freaking everybody out about the possibilities. Like, look, we dodged this but bullet for four years. But do you think that 2024? Oh, he's, he's going to win. <laughs> we I thought think, this, I thought this If he stays time. alive, well, here's the thing. I don't think Biden, Biden I think he's like Rocky training, losing weight. Biden is a real there. Biden is a real possibility of not making it in terms of like his body. Like that thing that he did the other day where he's locked up and also just the way he talks, he's clearly struggling. And, you know, I have a friend and she lost her dad to Alzheimer's. Yep. And she was saying, This is I watched all this and she goes, and then he was dead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is this is coming. I mean, this is fucking coming. I don't This is what I talked about when I was when I when people were mad at me and they're you're a Trump supporter. That's not what I said. What I said is I would vote for Trump before I vote for Biden cuz Biden is severely mentally camp compromised. Yeah. This is what I was thinking back then. Yeah. It's way worse now. Now everybody knows it. Now no one can lie. Like it's just there. Yeah. These these things where he just starts rambling and he called someone the president of Pennsylvania. Like he says crazy shit like that. He like you know he said the other day when I, I was a president of the United States for thirty six years. Like the he said he was the he vice. Said he president. was down at the border. Yeah, he was in two thousand eight apparently. Right. Drove right. Drove right through real fast <laughs> in a limo. I've been to the border. Sure, I've been there. I've been there. I bought a chicken. That lockup thing was that was that was strange. Yeah. I was. I said on dumpster fire. He looks like a, a baby taking a poo, like you know, yeah. like behind, in his nappies behind a chair. <laughs> Maybe he was trying to hold back diarrhea. Maybe it's innocent. Maybe it's, it's just, just like, so Shut. weird. I. It's such a yeah. So then we have this. I. I was. You know what he looked like? I'm Beavis. mentally preparing myself for. I. I. I'm mentally preparing myself for Trump running. And maybe winning only because I worry about the mental health of everyone around me in the event that that happens. Here's how he could lose if like Ron DeSantis got together with Greg Abbott and they created a Republican Party of people that ran states in a way that kept businesses open and everybody wants to shit on Florida, including people from like Billy Corbin's running in here, running all these numbers about people in Florida. Like, yeah, a lot of people in Florida died from the virus. But they also died in California. California. And when you adjust to age, when you age adjust, the, like how many people died, it's not really much of a difference. But there Florida's, a lot of olds in Florida. A lot of olds. <laughs> yeah, but Florida's economy did fucking way better, way better. Right. I mean, it really didn't suffer the way California's economy did. And it's weird did. that they don't take these things into consideration at all. Exactly. So did Texas. But I think people that have lost their businesses, people that have taken a big hit, those people do look at these people that are not forcing mandates, won't enforce them, and then did allow these things to stay open. If they can get those two guys together, they might be able to pull it off. Yeah, but and, do you think those Trump. two are going to take the risk of running against Trump in a primary and alienating their entire base? I don't know if they would be alienating their entire base. I don't know. It depends. I mean, he's still got a lot of support. He does. And maybe they think that he's the best way to win. I don't know. But here's the thing. The real problem is on the left. 
The real problem is on the left because a president, Kamala Harris, is poison. That's not happening. No one wants that. And then the other thing is Biden. It's like, I don't know if he can make it. And the idea of voting for him again and pretending that he's doing a good job is crazy. I want to reach out to when I right before the election, I had people emailing me at I am politically homeless dot at, at gmail dot com. And they were is that yours. Yeah. I am politically homeless at gmail. Yeah. Get well, we have a sub stack, too. <laughs> hey, <Hey-oh. laughs> they're coming in. Um, so we started a sub stack because I want to start posting a lot of these letters with people's permission. And my husband and I are starting a podcast and it's it's fascinating. I want to reach out to all the people who said they were voting for Biden and it was all people, people who came from the right to the center, people who, I mean, thousands yeah. of emails right before the election. Tim Pool actually was like talking all about this on his show right before because it was why I really, and I'm sure a lot of it is confirmation bias, but it was really why I thought Trump was going to win because so many people were red pilled. And I, I, think, I think it is confirmation bias because there's so many people that just did not want him in the office anymore. He's so polarizing. And they were also hoping. He wore people down. Yes. They were also hoping that once he got into office, he was going to change and become more presidential right. and drop that sort of bombastic rhetoric, and he didn't. And he can't. I mean, no. he, I always said the only person who could beat Trump is Trump, and I think that's actually what happened. Like, he just could not get out of his own way well, long enough. that true, though, if Biden beat him? <laughs> I mean, I think... But I think if he had been able to get out of his own way long enough and, like you said, be less of the... Uh, kind of narcissistic personality that he is, he might have been able to win. I think what's going to make him win is Biden as a president. I think (laughs) Biden being a president where, you know, we're not talking about Biden from 1988. We're talking about Biden from 2021 and he's got problems. And it's like, we're all going to have those fucking problems when we're 78 years old. Well, I do think the problems people are experiencing now in America compared to what they were experiencing with Trump, which were maybe more psychological, are a lot more real. Like inflation, having a lot more effect on their money and their life and their mandates and businesses. And and that wasn't necessarily the case. It was a lot of people just really losing their minds. And what's interesting is Trump is very pro-vaccine. He's just not very pro mandates. He's very pro vaccine. Yeah. He's telling people, you should get the vaccine. I got the vaccine. I'm happy. And he got the vaccine after he was sick. So he got COVID, got through it, and then got vaccinated on top of that. Yeah. Look, I think that we're, if someone can come along and offer real, legitimate solutions to the problems that we're facing that aren't getting any better. Yeah. Did you see that fucking the, uh, the pile of people that came through the border? Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the Mexican police tried to stop, and then they came charging through. Did you see that? That yesterday? was recent. Yeah, yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Fucking insane. A caravan of it looked like, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people, people that was. It are, looked like Bert's are... entire crowd in Tallahassee. <laughs> <laughs> that was in was that in Mexico or is yes. that yeah yeah that w- and these are the things I think the average American is very concerned about. They're yes. concerned about inflation. They're concerned that their dollar isn't going as far. This is one of the, I had a trucker on my podcast and I said, what are, what, you know, what's the big, the conversation we're having, the yeah. people who are having conversations and the people who are kind of on the ground, what is the, what's the stuff that's missing? Like what might we be missing? And over and over, I just heard from people in my DMs, inflation. They're like, when people start realizing that that dollar isn't worth anything, it's going to be, make sure you have guns. <laughs> and on that uh, note, we just did, dude, we did three and a half hours. Oh, wow. Crazy. We could do this every time. That's crazy. You and I it can't stop by. talking. We're I just, know. We're together, we're like, ah, blah, blah, Well, blah. we haven't talked in hours. I know, hours, I know. So we had a lot of catching up to I do. know, we do. We did. And we got to do for, it again. We got to do it more often. Well, we're definitely not staying in um, California. California, yeah. yeah. As soon as my husband has his license, we're out Come of there. on out we're coming. here, Bridget. And I think the market's flattening out, so. Yes, it is, until like they start vaccinating kids in California. <laughs> and then they'll start piling in here again. I love you. I Thank love you, you for too. having it's me It's always on. a pleasure. It's so much fun. Oh, tell everybody how to get to your podcast, uh, how to get into Walk-Ins Welcome, oh, yeah. and Dumpster Fire. 
Find me on Twitter. That's where I still live, unfortunately. Although, fi- follow me on Instagram. I'm, I'm more active there these days. <laughs> getting healthier. I'm getting healthier. While you have a child inside of your body, I'm I recommend staying the fuck off Twitter. <laughs> Look for the uh, me dancing pregnant videos on Instagram. <laughs> hey Um And that's all at Bridget Fetacy. You can find Walk-Ins Welcome anywhere podcasts are available. That is my baby. It deserves so much love. I have Dumpster Fire on Rumble. I'm going to promote Rumble. Um, it's also on YouTube, but go follow me on Rumble. And I have Fetacy.com is my where we have like unedited dumpster fire, which is really where the real shit is. And that's just where there's a nice community. I do workouts with the girls in there, with the women every day. It's super fun. Women! Women! And um, yeah, that's... Your I podcast that's is it. awesome too. It's very funny. It's It's infectiously fun. Like your laughter and and also very insightful. It's like it's a perfect combination of intelligent and funny. The dumpster fire one. All of them. Oh yeah. Everything you do. I love walk-ins because I get to talk to people. Like, you know, we had Megyn Kelly. I've been on again. Shapiro. He's hopeful. Um, Is he? Yeah, he is. Moved to Florida. That's why. He's hopeful because people are moving with their feet. And yeah. he said it's easier to be hopeful in places like Texas and Florida. Yes, I think but he's, he's right. like no hope for California. But yeah, yeah so we have amazing, huge guests for it's like the little podcast that could. Okay. And Joe told me to start it, so you have to listen. Yay! To it. <laughs> I'm glad you listened. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. 